Hey guys, what's going on? This is David Avalon with my co-host Robert Drysdale for Breaking the Guard. On today's episode, we have a very special guest, longtime friend of mine. He's uh, placed second in ADCC. He's just an all-around stud. Uh, he has just recently opened up his new school, and uh, I don't think I have to say anything else for uh, Keenan Cornelius. Thank you, Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It's a pleasure to be with you guys again, to be reunited with my Kimura sensei, David himself, <laughs> and Rob, Robert, a, a legend in the sport. I respect you both immensely. I'm happy oh. to be here. Thank you, man. We we try to bring like people with good content, people have like ideas and things to say. And that was really the goal with the podcast, right? That we was always trying to make something like, let's go beyond just talking about the average conversations that, you know, around fighting. Let's try to go into like the deeper layer, like what makes people move and why people are interesting. And you're, you're certainly a very interesting character, Keenan. So you, you, you've always been on the radar for us, you know, but I know you're thank very you, Thank you. So, uh, yeah, we're happy to have you on. Yeah. I've just been hustling over here, trying to just get everything in a row to try and figure out how to run a gym. I'm kind of just walking blind with some, <laughs> some brief. You, I've actually, you know I, I've actually been, Ooh. You know who's got it down with science? David Avalon. This guy, you know what he does? This guy, yeah. <laughs> I was actually watching. Brother. He left it to his brother and took off. He's the one who's got it all figured out. <laughs> no, it's funny because I was actually, I, ha I have a, like an old file somewhere of Marcus talking about a kid's program. And I was just watching it, trying to get some, refresh my memory of how the kid's programs were, were working over there because uh, I, you guys had a really tight ship. Well, I remember when I came down to Miami, we did that. Um, there's like an instructor training course we went yep. through and we kind of saw all the different moving parts of the situation. That was, that was like one of the most defining factors of like how I teach and like how I do things. And I, it, it was uh, incredibly helpful. And I still use a lot of those little tricks today, like helping people on the mats. It was, I thought it was especially cool how you guys went into detail on actual person to person communication, not just like how to run a business, but like actually how to deal with people from like almost a psychological standpoint, but approaching it in a layman's term terminology that I could understand as a 19 year old back in the day. Well, I'm, I'm glad so, to hear that, man. But yeah, you know, I memories. think, yeah, yeah, you're a very good instructor. I've seen the stuff you've been doing online and you've always gotten a, a very big following you know, so you've learned quite well and probably doing better than <laughs> than what we showed you back then. But I think it is something that a lot of people don't do, which is practice how to actually teach, how to communicate. Because it's very different from knowing how to do the techniques yourself to being able to teach it to somebody else. So it was, which is actually one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, because you now have taken on the role as an instructor, you own your own academy, Legion American Jiu Jitsu. And uh, I found that, at least for myself, and I think Robert could attest to the same, that when we take on that instructor role, that your technique actually cleans up a lot more, as well as like your understanding, just because you have to break things down to other people who might not get it like you do. And then you start seeing like the moving parts yourself, and it allows you to expand on the technique. I know when I was teaching Kimura Trap and I was teaching, you know, guys like you and Jason and all that, like I got a lot better at it. And then I also learned from what you guys were doing. I'm like, oh, okay. And it kind of a, it's a very like positive uh, experience. So I don't know what, what's your take on that? Like how have you felt now switching into that instructor role a bit? Yeah, I, th I think um, I definitely noticed all those things you're talking about. There's definitely something to be learned for, as an instructor, like you learn so much from the experience of seeing what people struggle with as far as the understanding of jujitsu, things, things that may come naturally for me that I didn't have to think about when I was a white belt. It brings you an awareness of what people actually need if you're trying to impart knowledge for the sake of knowledge itself and not to take like someone who's talented and like sculpt their talent into something slightly better, but like someone who's actually a total blank slate. How effectively can you teach that person effective jujitsu? And I noticed probably the, the, the biggest changes in how I approach teaching come from teaching white belts because we, I personally was kind of ingrained in this idea that you had to teach the traditional basics of jujitsu, like Gracie style stuff, right? Like the closed guard stuff, like the basic triangle stuff. Like we all saw that, or I did at least in my generation of coming up through jujitsu is like, I was exposed to a lot of those basics and Personally, I kind of skipped the basics. I just went straight into like fancy stuff as a white belt and blue belt and well, green belt actually went back in the day. I focused a lot on the cool stuff. I was all about flying triangles and all, like 
anything wild that I could pull off, I'd go for it. And I didn't, I didn't actually start learning actual fundamentals probably until around brown belt. Like I was just kind of mm. just making it up as I went, learning some basic guards like spider guard stuff as a purple belt. But then when I started actually um, reassessing my focus at brown and black belt, I focused primarily on fundamental stuff. And it's a whole different journey of discovery when you start trying to practice fundamentals of a sport because you start you take a path uh, down through history. And that's why I think it's so cool what Robert did with the new um, documentary he's coming out with because I like that that documentary, the whole premise of it was something that I was like kind of observing and I didn't really put it together until I start, I saw that he was doing stuff with it. And I was like, oh, there's an actual story here. And it did, it, it wasn't just me that it didn't really make sense to, because I thought there was a lot more going on in the early days of jujitsu in Brazil. And like, so I was basing a lot of my instruction off of that. Um, uh, but as like, I, I looked more into it and I started getting into judo more and like other di grappling disciplines like wrestling and Sambo, you can find a lot of fundamentals that kind of are on a, like a spectrum of these different arts and sports and you have to teach all of them still and so i guess i've been trying to incorporate that and i by no means have like a a, a resolute system for teaching basics now but definitely the biggest learning experience for me is kind of exploring basics again over and over again with brand new white belts and i i, I find it very fulfilling because learning fundamentals feels new to me because I've spent most of my jiu-jitsu career making moves up or <laughs> just like kind of playing with really fancy moves that other people had seen. So it's, it's very refreshing. I enjoy you, you it know what, uh, one, one thing you just touched on it, you know, I, I, I have a, I, I think that we all start with a hierarchy, right? A fundamental goes first, sophisticated comes later. Therefore, so fundamental is less, in, uh, is less uh, uh, functional than sophisticated, right? We make these associations. Mm -hmm. And I, I always go with the example that the number one choke in MMA is a rear naked choke. The number one submission in ADCC is a rear naked choke. And the only reason the rear naked choke is not the number one submission in Gi is because we have the bow and arrow, which is a lot better, right? Easier yeah. to get harder to defend, right? But like it says something about like fundamentals. And I think that the fundamentals, I, we, we shouldn't set a hierarchy is my point. You know, we've seen yeah. Mike Mutsumessi, we've seen you with very sophisticated jujitsu, And then we've seen Roger, which is very basic. Yeah. So I think that the Absolutely. hierarchy is, is the problem. It's like we can't not, it's like we can't see techniques without setting into a hierarchy. It's like the, the only relevant hierarchy is, does it work? That's the only, and yeah. to what do extent you, does it work, right? Do you think the hierarchy comes about from the, the mythology that's kind of formed in jiu-jitsu as I, well? I have a theory why that, it's, it's not going to be a popular one, but I think it has to do with the fact that as you get older, it is harder to keep up with evolution. And then right. what's old, therefore, must be more. What I know is always what's most important. No one that knows jiu-jitsu and teaches jiu-jitsu is ever going to go, oh, what I know is less important than what you're doing. It's always what I know best. Is what's, what's, real jiu-jitsu is always what I do best. Mm -hmm. Right? Ever notice that everyone, everyone's idea of jiu-jitsu is like, always like what they do best, right? I think it has to do with a, a difficulty that you, we haven't accepted that the sport changes. And there's something that happens to the mind as you get older. Like for the same reason, I suspect that people have a harder time learning new languages when they get older. It is harder to assimilate new techniques. I'll give an example. I like I never had a problem understanding techniques that were shown to me when I was in my twenties. It was like it was just like immediate. Sometimes when I'm watching Paulo Miao, you know, or Mike Mutsumas, it, it's like or even new. Like sometimes you're doing lapel stuff, and I have to like slow it down. Like it, it's it's harder for me to absorb that information, not only because it's new. Uh, but because I think that something happens with like the the the, the mind, it becomes it, it's it's harder to absorb new information. And I'm very yeah. sensitive to this because I've been in jujitsu my whole life. But I think that the, the the reflex of that is, oh, what's new is not good. This is let's stick to what's old because that's the real jujitsu, right? And I think that just just to finalize my thought and uh, let you guys jump in, um, I I think that the, the whole conversation is just misconstrued because when I watch you or Paul Lumiao, or Mike, or anyone who has like what we call sophisticated new modern jiu-jitsu, there's still far more of basic jiu-jitsu than there is sophisticated. The problem is that we have this hyper-like focus. Whenever you do a cool lapel sweep no one's ever seen before, that's the highlight. When you mm -hmm. posture and you grip fight and you put that knee shield up or you put like a very fundamental grip on the collar, which is all basic stuff, mm -hmm. it's taken for granted. It's like the confirmation bias, right? We focus on what we don't. On what we want to focus on, uh, but I think that there's 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 a lot more basic jujitsu going on. It's just that we shouldn't put it either ahead of advanced 
or of uh, or behind it. It's just a matter of like what works for you, and that's what really matters. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I I feel like I have kind of seen that as well, and even in my myself, like I just turned twenty eight, and I've been doing jujitsu for about fifteen years now. I mean, not counting as a child, like doing you know random little classes here and there, but. Um, I feel the same way as new stuff kind of enters the scene. I'm definitely a little bit more resistant to it. I ha kind of have my, like the tracks are set and I'm, I'm in those tracks, you know, and it's kind of hard to deviate a little bit and incorporate new things. Um, I think part of teaching fundamentals should be what you're talking about, kind of putting that in the frame and being like, okay, listen, things are going to change in advance and your best bet to stay adaptable and agile in your thinking and learning ability is to try new things a lot, like constantly try new things while working on your fundamentals. And another impasse maybe that is uh, part of the reason that fundamentals are difficult to teach is because they're very micro movements. Like you can show a basic close guard position and sure, the, the macro movement of wrapping your legs around someone is very obvious. It's like, yeah. okay, you can explain what that is doing. But then when you start getting into subtle shifts of your hips, like you move your hips two inches to this side and pull here, and that, that creates an entirely, entirely different outcome of how you're applying pressure. That is not basic. Like, yeah. <laughs> like it's a part of the basic position, but it's an incredibly complex thing to articulate or to even do like that. that there's a reason that Hodra has the best clothes guard and my clothes guard sucks. And it's because I don't have the same knowledge that he has from clothes yeah. guard. There's subtle minutia in his body movements and his muscular yeah. application of gripping and yeah. twisting and creating weird little leverage points that I do not possess. And I, it's very difficult to observe them. Like it's one of the things that you can't analyze. Like I've been doing this breakdown show for F flow grappling where I like draw on the screen and like try and analyze stuff, but you can't analyze those movements. It's all obscured by a gi or like clothing, right? You would need like an x-ray vision of their, and, and then like an alternating green red of like which muscles are activated and which aren't to actually be able to identify what is happening. I agree. And I think, I think that's a huge disconnect as well. And something that made me circling back to fundament fundamentals it made me appreciate it so much more because as I learned, as I got into brown and black belt and I started understanding pressure a little bit better because for a long time I did not have pressure. Like I, I could win matches, but I would always lose the back. I would lose side control. I would lose mount. I didn't understand that idea of like these subtle motions and inch like movements that make huge exactly. advancements in your actual tech technical application. And so it, it was enlightening for me to do it in reverse. Because it's like, oh, oh, I learn. You learn like half the basic move, and then you get into the fancy, the fancy fun stuff, and then you have to go back to the beginning and then actually learn the advanced basics. Yeah. And it's, it's. I think it's confusing for people that enter into the scene because it's not articulated in a way that makes sense. It's always it's referred to as invisible jujitsu, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. that's invisible jujitsu. Well, what which is, is invisible jujitsu? Which is a horrible way of framing it, right? Like it just makes yeah, it sound like you can't you can't see. Like it's it, it is visible. It's just it's it's hard. The minutia you're talking about is just harder to see. I know exactly what you're talking about. And that's, yeah. To me, that's the definition of technique is like how intelligent you can use this minutia because it's hard to explain to to to, to anyone really. Yeah, I take. Yeah. I, I feel like just to understand that concept, you need a, like five to seven to ten years of experience to be like kind of put it together that that's what your body's even doing. You know, it it feels so natural right off the bat. Yeah, that's why I I want to coin a new quote <laughs> recently inspired from Plato, which is only a master can truly understand ignorance, because one mm. I I know when I used to teach the Kimura trap system and I do the seminar. I could teach the whole thing in two days. And now, like the last time I do a camp, it's six days and I still don't get everything. Yeah. And, wow. and because I've been teaching it so much, there's so many little details now that I've become aware of. And, when, and you might have been doing them, but then when you have that, that focus and you say you can consciously see, oh, this is the, something that's part of the move your understanding becomes much better and you're able to apply better leverage and control pressure. But it's when you start doing that, you realize, man, I'm so ignorant of so many things yeah. because I am on just this one path. And I thought I knew it in the, I mean, I made a course on it and like 10 years later, it's like, man, I, the course initially was so underserved because I missed like hundreds of details. And yeah. this is just one thing. Now, if I try to learn like your lapel guard, I'm probably like decades <laughs> back of all the little details and nuances of it. So 
I feel like the more like I've perfected one area, I realize how ignorant I am of everything else. So those basics that you're talking about, they're they're basic because I, I what I like to say with basics is that they're very powerful techniques because even with just the preliminary mimic of the move, you will be successful. But right. if you have mastery of that move, you're yeah. devastating. You know what I mean? Whereas like complex moves or like fancy moves, they only work when you really got them well. You know, but like a, a white belt doesn't do the flying triangle too good. You know what I mean? But a white belt could do a basic triangle. Mm-hmm. But you give that black belt a triangle and it's lethal. So, I mean, that's why I think like what, you, what Rob says, like even though we learn it first as the fundamental and that hierarchy, I think the reason why we choose and we label the basics as first because they're so effective even mm-hmm. in the hands of somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing. You know, like I could teach somebody a guillotine and even like a one-day white belt, they'll get it where they can tap somebody out. But if I try to teach them, you know, flying on a plata, it's going to be a mess, you know? And go ahead. Yeah, I, to- I totally see what you're saying, and I-, I completely agree with you. It seems like there's sort of a repeating Dunning-Kruger effect as you go through jiu-jitsu. It's like of every single position, if it works the first time, you kind of are like, oh, yeah, it works, and I know this move now. And then <laughs> maybe yeah. five years later, you start you-, you maybe roll with someone who enlightens you to a new grip or a new elbow position or a new little finger control g- difference that makes a huge difference. And then you- your mind is experiences awe again the awe of how many options there are it's 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 pretty insane to think about and the way you put it where it's like the the basic movement is so effective it's really interesting because i think that is kind of what pushes people towards complex moves because they have the illusion of being highly complex but really it's just a a longer sequence of those larger movements that are effective and i think that's like that's one of the biggest issues with lapel guard stuff is i can teach it to white belts and they get it and it works against blue belts like (laughs) and that's not because they know the the minutiae of the movement but it's just because the just the larger grip switches are so blatant and big that if they just memorize them it works and then there's the whole other side of it that is kind of unexplored by most people except me, which is the actual like more subtle, subtle intricacies that you kind of discover. And yeah. that, sorry, just one last thing. That's actually like kind of the entire basis of my website. Like I, I want to try and record, like obviously I can never actually attain all of the jujitsu knowledge that is out there, but I think it'd be really cool to have, like document my personal exploration of all those facets, you know? Like if you could draw out a flow chart of all of your understanding of jujitsu and you could eventually start to see the blind spots that you have and then it would become more and more apparent where you are missing that information and then I can actually go and address it and focus on that myself to keep my own learning progressing at a, at a, at a rate that I'm happy with. Because if you don't document what you know, you're just like holding it all up in your brain. And then like, I know you guys have for sure experienced this. You probably, you, there's positions maybe a student asks you about that you haven't been in in six years because you just don't yeah. worry about that position anymore. But yeah. the second you're in the position, all of the, the information comes flooding back and you're like, oh yeah. And then also this can happen. And then also they can counter like this, even if you haven't experienced the, the move in forever. And if they hadn't asked you that question, you might've just left that information dormant forever. So I think it's really important for guys like us who have been around for a while. And obviously you guys have been around a lot longer than me, but I see this already. So you guys are probably experiencing it on an even higher level is just like really taking store of what, you know, because it, the learning doesn't stop. Like that's, that's what keeps us doing jujitsu. It's like, no matter, no matter how sick of jujitsu you are, you've been doing it forever. You're training so hard forever when like you can not want to train, but when you're actually in a round rolling and there, the, the pressure is on to win or to, to fight, you forget all of that every single time. Like you always get pulled back into the infinite wonder of the possibilities of jujitsu. It never gets completely redundant. And I think yeah. like that longevity is incredibly valuable, not just as a sport that we do, but as in our ability to monetize our information. Like you, yeah. you, we need to be able to document it and show people just how vast it actually is because otherwise they just default to the mythology like that has come to exist. And it's just like all, probably it's covered so much in uh, Robert's documentary, but I think, it, I think it's incredibly fascinating still to this day 
but that like the more I think about that and the more I teach, the more I lose interest in the actual competitive aspect of jujitsu and gain interest in the intricacies of it and trying to pursue that knowledge so that I can teach it better as uh, well. You know, you, you actually touch on so many different, you know, things that we just so many different ways we can approach this. Um, yeah, I, w one thing that you, you, you mentioned, I, I just want to make a comment there is I, I think that we should never, we got to be careful not to ever be in that position where we can lose that awe, like the one you described. Yeah. Right? I think it's fundamental. I think it's one of my favorite things. It's a problem in BJJ, but it's also one of my favorite things is the fact that jujitsu does not, I was talking to Roddy Ferguson a while ago, and he mentioned the canon that judo has, and judo has a fixed canon. It's correct, and it's preserved in kata, and I never thought of it that way. But mm. Kata preserves it, right? Interesting. You know what judo is at its core because that is unchangeable and is not affected by the art and the sport. Right. right? Or by the sport in this case. Uh, but in terms of jiu-jitsu, it's so highly creative. I like that. I like the fact to me it's one of the reasons why it's always been so appealing to me is that it's open source, right? Anyone can can go and tweak it. Yeah. For example, like, and I, I think that some of this is, is you know, um, it's just very ingrained in the culture of the sport. So, for example, if you teach a white belt or a blue belt, or you do something slightly different than what I do and what I taught, I don't stop them. You know, in fact, the, the attitude is normally like you and if it's working, you give them the incentive. Like I say this, at least for my speaking for myself, I always say this when I teach is if you do it different and it works for you, then that's that. Like there's this should not be like there's no yeah. doubt that there's no right and wrong. I don't even like to use the word the words right and wrong in jujitsu because too often have I seen what is technically wrong work. Like yeah. I just thought not to cross my feet when I arm bar. I do it all the time. It works better. Yeah, you know? I that's mean, a that's was, a huge example of one for sure. Yeah, I, I cross my when I'm on the back, I cross my ankles all the time. And it was like, why would you yeah. get full lock? I just cross it by the belly. I don't get full lock. It's much better control. And I never slide off the back. I stopped sliding off the back as a black belt when I finally started crossing my ankle. <laughs> right. Know? But it was because like dogma has this power of like it just has a, such a, a, a dominant presence in the culture of the sport permanently. And the longer it's been around, the less question it is. And the less question it is, well, it's holy now at this point because it's always been said. Right. So it must be true. Right. And it's it's almost like you you, you, you prevent the sport from evolving when you have that sort of mindset, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. that's one of the Go benefits. Ahead, David, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's one of the benefits I think my brother and I had because we didn't really have a sensei or an instructor when we were starting. There was nobody saying, you're not supposed to do that for this reason, right? Like, so mm -hmm. we were very self-taught. And so in, in one way, it's slower growth, but it's unlimited in the sense that we weren't told, oh, you can't cross your ankles behind the back, you know, like, we learned everything, you know, like reinventing the wheel, so to speak. But there is something to be said about that approach because you gain more understanding. You know, you learn, well, if you cross your ankles and they're too low, you're going to get foot locked, you know. Or if you do this, you're going to get this. So you learn the reasons of why the rules are in place. And then sometimes these can be challenged, right? Um, like people say, oh, you can't submit somebody from inside their closed guard. That's not true. You can. There's, I know a bunch of ways of doing it, but it, but normally that would be taboo, right? If an instructor saw you trying to wrist lock somebody or kimura someone from their guard, to be, what are you doing? You know, you're. And they would Wait, you can kimura someone from inside their closed guard? Yes, I, 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 I've seen him do it. Yeah, I've <laughs> never seen that. I need I to see that. Is that on any of your instructionals, or is that yeah. just a personal thing? No, no, it's on the course. I, everything I do is on there. Wow. Yeah, so it ends up becoming a guard pass because the Kimura pressure turns them sideways. Mm -hmm. So, like, you slide out of that guard and then you end up inside. But it starts from the guard. It is a risky move. It's not like, I don't say go for that right away, but if you have good wrist control, you know, yeah. like, you're going to pass the hand behind the back pass. Uh -huh. Sometimes you can just jump right for the Kimura from there. And when you let your hips sag, their, hip, their legs go from here to here, you know? So yeah, then yeah, it's easier to scoot your hips out and get out. Interesting. I, I, I think that's like those kind of moves. I love those kind of moves because it actually gives us something to do when we're training with lower belts. Like yeah. I yeah. personally enjoy training with lower belts. I think it's a lot of fun. I don't I just don't do anything that I would normally do. I try all of the moves that I don't I'm not really comfortable with. I try all of the moves that I maybe don't even like or like visually are just repulsive to me. And I don't want to train them because I disagree with them for some reason or another. So yeah, that's like that's a really really well put. I totally agree, and the the like the dogma that you're talking about, Robert, that's actually part of the reason I want like because I heard you guys talking about American Jiu Jitsu in the in the past on your podcast briefly, yeah. and 
that's part of the reason that I want to try and push it a little bit because it's almost like if you refer to what you're doing as BJJ, not only are you um, going against the dogma or the religion at this point and people fight back against you, but it also anything that you do contribute gets absorbed by that eventually. And there is no differentiation anymore. And just like there's a misconception of how jujitsu was like actually reached a, a revolution where all these new things were added in the nineties with like more with Ted Day and all of those guys, uh, Margarita and the, the whole, the whole crew. Um, it's very easy to just get caught up in that and people forget and people don't know to, who to attribute it to. And it's, it's like, yes, it is super open source and it should be, which I have another point about that but at what at what point do we do we get to say that's my contribute my contribution to the sport you know and it's like i don't want to put you can you can do it how it's been done by putting your name associated with the guard potentially or like something to that effect like delahiva or something but i always felt that that wasn't the way to do it i felt that it's like call it what you want to call it you don't necessarily have to put your name on it to have it be associated with your contribution to to contribute to your personal legacy but you do have to differentiate yourself some way and i i it seems like the logical way to do that is just to associate it with your nationality because then you can kind of group what changes came from where and then the competition for that um like having that movement attributed to you in some way whether it's just through association or by name uh, it becomes a lot easier for people to, to digest in the same way that grappling arts have kind of like all grappling is essentially the same. It's only di it's just different rules being applied, right? Like you can gain leverage in very unconventional ways in a wrestling match, in a sambo match, in a judo match. The only restrictions that guide how the sport evolves are the rules. Right. And I think part of the reason that jujitsu is so much more successful than all of those sports is you can take out all of the rules and just leave one rule submission. And when you can when you can distill a sport down to a singular rule, it allows you a yes or no at the end of it. And the yes or no allows evolution to occur because it's it finally becomes very clear what works and what doesn't work because you can have an entire round trying all sorts of different crazy moves. But if someone gets submitted, there's a reason that they got submitted and you can kind of backtrace that and understand how it all came to be. But in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, like let's associate with like the sport industry, like IBJJF and stuff. Adding rules to that has created a lot of very sport specific things to jujitsu, which I'll, which is a point of contention for people who train because a lot of people train for self defense, a lot of people train for no gi, a lot of people train just for IBJJF, a lot of people train just to train. And you guys know as well as I that there are highly specific rules that completely change the way you grapple. Like to a point that your very instincts get changed based on a set of rules, yeah. not and not necessarily even a set of rules. And in particular, I'm talking about like maybe you get an advantage to make someone turtle, or you get an advantage for exposing, uh, exposing, or uh, passing someone's guard, and they turn away, and they would rather take the advantage than the guard pass. And then an entire system of back attacks comes off of passing the guard because you know they're always going to turn away, but they're only going to do that because they've been trained to do that because they know that if they don't turn away, they there's a there's a incentive to turn away it's less points scored on you and so that creates an entire subsection of a uh, competitive jujitsu that is separate from what a lot of people recognize yes. and i think i just don't think it's a bad thing to have subgenres. just like in any other culture there are subcultures whether it's skateboarding or music or surfing or like and then subcultures within the subcultures like in music there's jazz and then there's blues and it's like that those things kind of came from each other in in some capacity and i think jiu-jitsu can be this the same but if you always encompass it back to the original defining thing of music or of bjj when when bjj is kind of a misnomer because it's more jiu-jitsu just just jiu-jitsu because i mean we we see that through what was available before it came to brazil it, it seems constricting on the very idea of innovation that we're talking about. So to, to unrestrict innovation, you, you need to allow the different styles to have their different names. And it's not like American Jiu Jitsu is not the idea of like putting a stamp over the B with an A by any means. And it's also not to set entirely as associate a, a group of techniques that was developed 
in a culture of people, the American culture of jiu-jitsu, that has actually become quite substantial. Eddie Bravo, my stuff, the Danaher guys, your stuff, like Drysdale stuff. All of that is encompassed in some capacity as the American genre of jiu-jitsu. And it doesn't, it's, it's not trying to lay claim to anything else. It only intends to be what it is, which is a classification more than anything. And then the secondary idea behind it would just be so I can actually represent my nation, which I think is important. It, on, it, on a global field of competition, I am not an American Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner. I'm an American jiu-jitsu practitioner, right? As far as like forward-facing representation of who I am and what I represent and learn and who I've learned from. Like if you actually look at my list of instructors, the only Brazilian that I got a belt from was my black belt from Andre, but everyone else was American. I got my belts from BJ Penn, my dad, Lloyd Irvin, and I've learned the most from Americans as well. JT Torres, Andres Brunovskis, and everyone that I've trained with throughout the years because there's just a natural separation of culture, maybe due to language barrier, due to cultural norms, whatever that is, in a jiu-jitsu room where there's both cultures, Brazilian and American, or any other culture, there's just a natural kind of like click thing that forms. It's, it's almost unavoidable. I don't speak Portuguese. I would like to. I just haven't had the patience or drive to actually do it. I think that would have eliminated some of that separation. And I don't, I'm still friends with all of my Brazilian friends as well, but most of my influence is American. And I, I pay homage to those people that I actually learned from through that title. Does that make sense? No, yeah, it, it kind of resonates with what we were saying before, which is two reasons. One, to me, I know Robert, and I don't want to speak for you, but I know Robert would prefer to label just jiu-jitsu. For all and I would as well, but yeah. I don't think you can convince Brazilian jiu-jitsu to take away the label. So it seems like yeah. the only... You, you know what's ironic about this? You, you, you don't, no one in Brazil has ever called it Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Like, when, when you go right. to China, you don't ask for Chinese food. Right. Yeah. Food. Like I was, I was in Thailand once. True story. And I asked for Thai coffee, Thai tea, and they made fun of me. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like Thai tea. And then they're like, you mean tea? Yeah. And they're like, oh, that's like, and it, it's, it's, it's true. Like the, the term Brazilian Jiu Jitsu did not come into usage until the nineties. It was yeah. only after the Horian slash Hoist Gracie slash UFC revolution, right? Like the second Jiu Jitsu boom. The first one is early in the 20th century. The second Jiu Jitsu boom takes place in the nineties. And that's when the term Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, is, is put into use. I don't think it was for nationalistic purposes. I really don't think that. Because I, I don't see, and because I'm half Brazilian, I feel like I can say this without being called a racist, but I don't think Brazilians are very nationalistic in, in, in general. They're certainly not like Americans. You know, like, I don't mm -hmm. think it's something that they're like, you know, most Brazilians cannot sing the, the Brazilian national anthem to save their lives, even though the Brazilian national anthem is very long. <laughs> in their defense, <laughs> it's incredibly long. It's not easy one to sing. But... In general, it's not something that they're very uh, passionate about for the most part. So I think it was more to distinguish the term, ju term jujitsu. There still were some Japanese styles, right? They're very dramatically from one another, but they use the term jujitsu. They were left over. They were not absorbed by judo. Most jujitsu schools were absorbed by the onslaught of judo of the 1950s, 60s, and onwards. But, you know, they, they, I think it was a matter of distinguishing. I, I wouldn't have an, I actually always preferred jujitsu because I, I never liked it. With that being said, I do see today, um, and I actually changed my mind on this fairly recently, and it's not for nationalistic purposes, nothing like that. But I think that a martial arts go, it goes beyond technique. There are certain cultural aspects that become, are very important to the, 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 the perception people have that martial arts. They go beyond the technique. I'll give an example. When, I, when we went to the Kosen Judo School in, um, in uh, Japan for the documentary, it was basically, it's very traditional judo school. So the, the, the black belts show up like 30 minutes early class. They sweep the mats, the black belts, sweeping the mats prior to class. I actually have a video. It's a beautiful video of a symphony of the mats being swept at the same time. It was, and it, was, it was unprompted. It was like automatic. It's not something they had to be told what to do, right? The geese were immaculately clean. Um, very, the bow was like a 90-degree bow. And then, you know, a few days later, we visit Yukina Kai's gym also in Tokyo, right? We go to... And Yuki Nakai is the president of the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Japanese Federation of Jiu-Jitsu, right? Yeah, and I put goes, him to sleep. Uh, just him watching my match, he fell asleep next to my match in Japan one time. <laughs> it was the funniest. I saw. I went back and saw the video, and he literally had passed out. I was like, I'm not doing my my sport proud right now. I put Yuki Nakai to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> 
it was sad. But, uh, sad but like, anyway, like we, we, when I showed up there, like there was this like relaxed manner at his gym, right? Like the whole thing of like, like sitting with your legs uncrossed, taking your time to tape your fingers. Like people were late to class. And mm-hmm. there were aspects that I felt that were not Japanese. Like they were very Absolutely, French yeah. the Brazilian culture, the whole being late thing not being a big deal. Right. So for that reason, like I understand, like I, I could see why someone would use a B, even though I still I'm like kind of 50 50 on it. But like the case of American Jiu Jitsu, like I, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of like a general like it's or like you are an American representative. You want to make your country proud. And most of your instructors, as you mentioned, were Americans. And I can see that. But like, I think it's just a matter of like how people perceive what American Jiu Jitsu means, because it is not a different martial art. Right. What you're yeah. doing is paying homage to the people who have taught you the place, you know, some of the sort of that you're putting like a stamp on it. Like these techniques were developed in the United States and not Brazil, rather name it a Keenan guard. Right. Which mm-hmm. you could have done. You didn't name it Keenan guard. You named it, you know, lapel guard or warm guard or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's developed in the United States. and You kind of put a stamp on it. Right. I mean, so when, I mean, you, I guess you could just like I think that when you, you name an American Jiu Jitsu, the way most people see it is, oh, you, uh, you're claiming it's a new style. And it's, it's not a new style, and I, I don't think you disagree with me here, in the sense where it's v- wildly different. I'll give you an example. Like, there's a historian that I exchange emails with. Like, he's probably the most knowledgeable guy in all the history of jiu-jitsu. His name is Roberto Pedrera. His books are on Amazon. I highly recommend them for anyone that wants to understand jiu-jitsu today, not the past. If you understand the present, you got to understand the history, right? And he calls jiu-jitsu a sub-style of judo. Brazilian jiu-jitsu is a sub-style of judo or a sub root mm-hmm. right? And I go, I agree with him to an extent, but I think that today, in this day, in 2020, BJJ differs dramatic, so dramatically from, or jiu-jitsu, whatever you want to call it, from Japanese, uh, uh, from judo, that I can't, I can't, rec- I can't I, I recognize the same martial art anymore. Like, I think if you put Mike Mutsumesi against, like, an Olympian judoka, there's no communication there. There's yeah, no, no, the, the absolutely. software doesn't doesn't work. It's like, yeah, you know, it just doesn't work. Right. Uh, um, whereas, like, I mean, when I see you in competition, the communication works. So what I see is, even though I, I think that you're probably one of the most sophisticated competitors out there, I think that's fair to say. And I and I, you know, I really mean that, man, like you, you, you're doing stuff that I have a hard time keeping up with, man. Like, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go out to like ask pay for privates, but I would love to have a lapel guard private with you one of these days because i have a hard time seeing what you're doing without having been explained to me like you know reverse engineered but at the same time i don't feel it's like fundamentally different from what's being done right mm-hmm. so it is the same martial art you're just late if i understand correctly you're labeling it because you want to pay homage to your instructors um and to your country where you were born and living is that correct yes absolutely um yeah ju- if american jiu-jitsu was a new style and it was based around lapels that would be a very boring situation to watch <laughs> already it's pr- it's frustrating to train with uh, my students because some of them start using lapels on me and if i use them back it, it doesn't work there's <laughs> it just you just reach an impasse where there's no more opportunity and it just kind of destroys the entire thing so i would say let it's less of a new style and more of a highly specific counter to jiu jitsu which also works in the acronym as anti jiu jitsu <laughs> so I'm willing I'm willing to concede the American and go to anti yeah. in the event that I am uh, you justify it in that way. So I relinquished the American in our situation it is now anti jiu-jitsu. <laughs> you have an argument against that. Oh uh, man, like I will say this. I've had blue belts hold me in that lapel from 50-50 or the one oh, you wrap the leg. And, and I had nothing to do with that one. I swear. And, I, the, and the grip is underneath the knee, right? So you can't yeah, really can't fight them. And I'm going, I don't know what to do. And I, I've actually had this argument with IBJJF more times than I can count. You guys got to stop the fight at that point. And that reset. position should be legal. I totally Be, agree. Because there's, there's, I mean, I've had blue belts hold me there. They're like 30, 40 pounds lighter than me, and I can't move. Like there's nothing I can do other than like I want to punch them in the head at this point because I'm losing my patience, right? There's nothing you can do to. I mean, I'm sure there's like some, there's some way of getting out of there, but it's 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 such a wrap. Right. And there's no purpose to it. So like my, my criteria is anytime there's no purpose. To yeah. What you're doing, we got to do something to stop it. And it or if the purpose is to hold, to not have purpose, stall. if the purpose yeah. is to not yeah. have purpose in that moment to exactly. stall, it's like that shouldn't be allowed. I totally yeah. agree. But I mean, it's hard to it's hard to justify because like once you start taking away things, you can't really put them back. 
you know? So if it's not like incredibly damaging, I would be, I, I'm, I'm more for less rules than more rules, just because I think the second you start putting rules on, it does limit future opportunity. Because from what I understand about lapel guards, which are pretty much on the cutting edge of new, I would say, because it's, it's like there's so much, now, now I have counters for counters to lapel when people still haven't figured out the counters originally. <laughs> like I've, I've taken it like more for, like further and more abstract than it needs to be at this point. Um, I think what I've seen from like very tricky positions in worm guard spots that should feel that do normally feel very locked and like you can't do anything. It's like, well, this doesn't seem fair because there's no option. There are options usually. It, they're just very they're counterintuitive. They're counterintuitive to normal jujitsu functionality, which is very limb based. It's very like physical body on body centric. But when you if you if you have two nogi guys and you hand them both a rope and the rope is tied around their neck, <laughs> like <laughs> it changes the whole dynamic of grappling because yeah. now you're grappling with a weapon, essentially. Yeah. And the what the tool or it's a tool. It's another tool that was not previously explored. So in that regard, it is very similar to jujitsu, as you're saying, but it's also very different. And I'm not sh like I agree, it doesn't necess necessitate its own categorization, but I'm also not sure how to fit it into the previous categorization. You know, because you're there, I'm f I've found ways to use this rope that multiplies the force I can put on someone. I can use, I can be more effective with less energy, which is kind of like the. That in that way, it is very similar to what jujitsu is, because that's what jujitsu is about. It's, you're optimizing the amount of energy output you're you're using with with maximum effectiveness. So, yeah, I'm I'm not super tied to the idea. More than anything, I just appreciate that people acknowledge it at all. I like I I would think that people just ignore that I even say it because it is it do, it isn't really grounded on much. It's it's a it's a seedling of what I intend the future to hold and the direction I'm taking it and the direction that I want to have like teach in which really just pushes the whole innovation point anyways like the only the only downside i see about traditional brazilian jiu-jitsu is just that there is some li limitation on innovation and the limitation comes from a psychological standpoint like you were saying people like just an old dog doesn't want to learn new tricks um to the rule system that limits innovation like adding rules to a position that kind of like we'll never know the actual counter because we've not we, we eliminated the problem with a rule instead of with a counter um, and like I saw, I, I did a breakdown on a match yesterday of Marigali versus Philippe Pena and he, Philippe Pena kept putting Marigali in 50, 50. And I was like, okay, yeah, 50, 50, it's kind of been solved now. It's like a, a high level black belt knows how to get out of 50, 50 pretty effectively. It's no longer considered a super stalling position. People will go for it, but there's a pretty effective counter. You, you underhook both the ankles and you bring it to the other side and the position kind of falls apart. Um, and I think 50, 50 went through the, the biggest growing pains. From a from a perception standpoint of of the audience of jujitsu, because it it was really considered a stalling move, and it was really killing the competition uh, yeah. watchability for a while. It was like, what is this? This is so lame. And I was part of it because it was effective. I I mean, I could submit people from there, um, but most people are just using it to seesaw back and forth. But you don't see that as much, at least at the higher weights now. Bigger guys are able to deal with it. So I think with any position that potentially can be restrictive also can potentially be countered and so in the match marigali was countering the 50 50 and philippe was inverting through over his own face into what ryan hall calls backside 50 50 which i'm not for sure if you guys are familiar with because i just learned about it recently but backside 50 50 sounds like a snowboarding move but it's the, <laughs> it's the it's the it's the position that lachlan used to tap everyone out at adcc it's like a weird inversion thing from 50 50 where you come out the backside and they can't turn either way and the heel is exposed and so philippe was using that same motion not in a nogi setting but in a gi setting to counter the 50 50 counter and he did it like six times. And I, I, I was talking in the match about how it's like, oh, yeah, Philippe, he has a very scrambly style. Like, I wouldn't be able to identify his systems within the scramble. But then we saw a system emerge, and it was like, oh, that is the system. It's like it's a scrambly thing that at first glance it doesn't look like it, it's functional. But then he does it three times, and it worked all three times. And I'm like, oh, well, that's part of his system. And so – yeah, I'm just I'm just a big proponent of just like – like you are saying, there is no wrong way to do things. And I think that applies in in not just in jujitsu, but in life and the way the way you want to um, present yourself to an audience. So you like know calling what? It whatever you want is, I think, is fine as well. 
you know yeah, what? You know, uh, I'm sorry, Dave. Go ahead. Uh, I think what I had said originally, which I think still stands with the American Jiu Jitsu. You know, you're a young guy. You're starting your own uh, school. If you want to name it Keenan Jiu Jitsu, Cornelius Jiu Jitsu, whatever you want, you're more than welcome to. Right? Like I think more power to you. We, I, I guess the, the question that Robert has, and, and I do too in part, is what, I guess, in the future, how is American Jiu-Jitsu, as you are shaping it to be, will be different? Like how Robert was saying that they, when they brought well, Jiu-Jitsu into the Gracies, rather, into the U.S., they had to distinguish it because they didn't want to get confused for Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, which was very different stylistically. They called it Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You know, so now you're making American Jiu-Jitsu. So are we saying in the future... We're going to see a very different style, maybe not as completely different, but there's going to definitely be a pattern. Kind of like right now, we can look at 10th Planet Jiu Jitsu, and you can usually see, you know, like there's a, a different way that these guys play. You know, they're still doing the same game, but their approach is different, you know, and not just with the, the pot smell or anything like that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the whole approach is a little bit different too. The, so yeah. I, I, to I totally agree. Um, Robert, do you want to finish what you were saying before I no, answer No, that? no. Um, I was just going to add, um, you know, I, yes, I think there's, uh, um, th there's, we have this thing where we go, you know, like, let's again, like the old and the new or like the sophisticated versus the simple, right? And I, I just think that we should look at things from always from a point of view of perspective, uh, from of effectiveness. Like that should always be the north. Like does it yeah. work? Right? That should be the guiding north, no matter for or martial art, with like a lean towards the martial art end of the spectrum, not just a. I think the sport aspect speaks how we practice, but we got to remember above all, it is a martial art. Uh, meaning like we, it should be like working in a fight, right? That's that's I've always I've always like leaned towards that, even though I understand that there's a lot of things that just aren't going to work in a fight, and they're part of the sport, and it is what it is. Um. There is uh, 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 um, some things that, like, I don't think, for example, I think that innovation should always be in the hands of the youth. And I mm. think that it's a very important thing for any community to learn. I think that, you know, once you get, like, the old dog that doesn't want to learn a new trick mindset, you, you cripple the martial art, right, that canon. With that being said, I don't, th I think that there's certain, a, a lot of elements, and they have, like, a very vocal presence in the community because they're often team leaders or they're known they're like they're fairly popular so they have a, a loud voice in the community so to speak but they're not the majority i don't think they're the majority i think the majority of brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners both united states and brazil are young they're open-minded and they're wanting to learn and they want to improve on the sport like mm -hmm. i i've been recently started working on heel hooks in the gi because i think it's going to become illegal in a matter of time it's a matter of time before they become the norm so mm -hmm. i'm like i'm already playing around with heel hooks in the gi right because i it's it's an effort that I make to try to stay ahead of the curve and try to like always you know be uh, advancing jujitsu because I think that's our role is not to be eternalized through our accomplishments but really just to improve on the art for future future generations. I think that in as a whole that the realm of jujitsu, American jujitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, whatever you want to call it, Kina jujitsu, whatever the case, it's we we are a jit for the most part a community moving forward towards evolution. And this is not American or Brazilian or Japanese mm -hmm. or anyone. We move towards evolution because we have a culture of open software. Now, I am less familiar with other martial arts, right? Uh, but from my understanding, I think they're less open. I think it's like your instructor teaches you how to do one thing and you kind of follow, this is how you throw, you know, like I had boxing coaches of mine that like, no, this is how you throw a right hand. You know, they're very mm -hmm. strict on it. And me, I, I'm not that familiar with boxing, but I do see an overall pattern in BJJ for innovation, right? I think that the old dogs that don't want to learn new trick, they're really the minority and they're a dying breed. I think that, you know, younger generations, but their generation is retiring now, like my generation, or like Cyborg and Brawl, I don't see these guys going 10 years from now. I know that I won't, right? But like 10, 20 years from now going, oh no, that's not real jujitsu. Because I think they're open-minded enough. That's the majority of the community. So yeah, I think that innovation is always should be the, the, the guiding north regardless of, you know, what we call it or, you know, or anything it's just effectiveness and innovation okay so um i i totally agree with everything you guys are saying and there's just one more layer to the american jiu-jitsu thing i want to get your both of your opinions on okay. so one of the str the struggles that i see that i didn't personally experience this at coming up through grappling through just happenstance industriousness uh being fortunate enough to be around people who kind of sh showed me a little bit behind the curtain of how sales work and like understanding that there's more to know than just like jujitsu ju that helped me immensely in actually being able to make money with jujitsu and like actually have a life 
like outside of jujitsu. You can't do it only with jujitsu. Like you can study jujitsu as hard as you want. You can be the best guy in the world. But if you're not applying your skills into another realm in some capacity, whether through selling it or teaching, uh, which is also selling it or any sort of way to actually monetize it besides making money through competing, that's an incredibly difficult thing for people to do for whatever reason, whether it's just ignorance or they just an apathy. All of my peers that I grew up with, literally grew up with training and competing, searching for the same goal. All of us had the same goal. Same goal was Black Belt World Champion. Plenty of my friends became Black Belt World Champions. I did not. I'm a, I'm a no-gi world champion. I don't count that personally. I think the best I've done in gi worlds uh, is third place in the absolute, I think. I think I, I think I placed once in my division in, in third. Series of unfortunate events. I don't want to get into it. It's, it's too painful. But... <laughs> Uh, you got time. You're young. You got time. Yeah. You got <laughs> I know it's not over by any means. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it's super inspiring to see some of the, the, the generation before me competing until they're 38 or 40. Like it's so awesome. Like you just do longevity. I never would have suspected that that was how it plays out. So there's a, there's an unspoken struggle for young jujitsu practitioners, the innovators, the ones that you're saying are, are in charge of carrying on the torch. They don't know how to make money with jiu-jitsu and there isn't a system in place to do that this the only system in place is the one that already persists which is you eventually open a gym but the entire process of learning doesn't involve any of the instruction you need to open a gym or any of the instruction you need to know how to market yourself or be able to sell your skill like you have a skill that no one else has you spent more time on the mat than almost anyone else, and people want that information from you. And these guys, these 99% of these guys don't know how to sell it. And so how can they, there is no future for them. And in, 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 you could look at it in a way that they do not have a future in jujitsu that they will, not the future, it's not that they don't have a future, it's that they could have a better one. And I think it's very important that going forward, there is some sort of, and, Lloyd was doing this for us. Like we, we he did this for us. And I, th I think a lot of us didn't understand that that's what he was trying to do. Um, because it, it feels counterintuitive to work on something other than jujitsu while you're doing jujitsu. It felt like I personally didn't like it. I wanted to just get back to jujitsu, but I was very, I was grateful that I was put into the situation where I was exposed to that kind of work and understanding it because it was immensely valuable. I can't even put a price tag on the, that year that I spent in the ICR, like writing some for like doing SEO, like, like I don't use SEO in my daily life, but just knowing that that exists has like opened up so much information for me on how to actually optimize the, my ability to sell my skill. Um, so American Jiu Jitsu versus Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I think that there actually is a competitive edge to calling it American Jiu Jitsu if you are American. And that's because how can you compete with a Brazilian who has better skills than you they might actually be better at jiu-jitsu than you. Maybe they're not a better teacher than you, but they might have better skills than you. The sport is called Brazilian jiu-jitsu. To anyone who enters the sport, it is considered Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And if there is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym on the street taught with a Brazilian instructor versus a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym taught with an American instructor, there's two sides to that coin. One, the guy's Brazilian. So there's a there's an uh, connotation that he probably knows Brazilian jiu-jitsu better. And then the other side is that maybe the American guy, it's English is his first language. And what is more important, the ability to articulate more effectively or the guy who is associated inherently with the sport. And so regardless of if that is a large or a little advantage or none at all, I think it, it, it deserves concern for American grapplers that are, that don't know how to monetize their skills. And so I think, and this is just a hypothesis, that if there is some separation between the two, based on if you're American or Brazilian, there will be more success for some of these up and coming American guys that still don't do very well in competitions. Like to this day, even though there's probably probably an equal amount of Americans doing jiu-jitsu as Brazilians, would you guys agree on that? Are we approaching a halfway point maybe? I, no, I, or? I, I think you made a very good point. Like, you know, it does, like, this is actually a problem, something I noticed, right? Because coming from Brazil, you know, I know who's who over there. 90% of my competition experience was in Brazil. So I know who's who. And mm -hmm. then watching some of these guys when they land here, you know, and then it's like all of a sudden they're grandmasters. I'm like, I know who you are. Right. <laughs> you know, but, but, they, but they speak with an accent and it helps because you're right. Like I've had, 
you know, I think that it gives them a strong, like, it's like for, for, from Thailand and you're teaching Thai box. Yeah, you exactly. I would want to learn like, from a Thai guy. Not for sure. the case. It does because you're from Thailand does not make you a good Thai boxer. And just because you're American does not mean you're a good Thai boxer. Right. Yeah. But like the, 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 the crowd does not have the ability. If you're, if you're new to this, they don't have the, the, the critical thinking to be able to distinguish. It would be like five, six years before they figure it out. And when they do, now you have that loyalty thing, right? You've created too many yeah. ties in the gym. So. Exactly. As well as the, the, the Brazilians still dominate the competition circuit. Like there are really good Americans for sure, but there's more Brazilians on the podiums to this day still. So if you can, you can go and literally look at results, right? And the results say that the Brazilians are better. And to, that could be true. However, that doesn't mean that we should be excluded from the, the potentiality of monetizing our skills as Americans. And, it honestly could have a, a, a zero effect, but I wouldn't be willing to risk it, you um, know, when it comes to your actual potential of success and actually ha living comfortably and reaching your ceiling as far as, I mean, if there is a ceiling for you, which hopefully yeah. there isn't, uh, reaching that point of where you're like feeling like, okay, I'm moving up in the world. It's like I spent 10 years on this skill and it's finally paying off, you know, if you spend 10 years on it and then you wake up one day and you're like, fuck. What do I do now? Which happened to a lot of people when coronavirus hit. And a lot of people have been messaging me. Huh, you're feeling that too? <laughs> yeah, I think we all I'm did, right? Considering different jobs. Like, right. I think we all were. We were like, damn, like, I, I mean, I know I was. I was like, I just spent, like sunk my life savings into this building that I don't own. <laughs> it's like in oh. five years, none of the money that I just put into this building is going to be mine. I was all a gamble based on hoping I can regain that, that amount of money in five years. That's like what the gamble is. And can I do it? Probably. But with coronavirus, maybe not. And it's like, holy shit, what am I going to do? So that was kind of like part of my my campaign, let's say, for American Jiu Jitsu is to be like, like, well, you know, we should probably focus on how to sell this shit, because if you don't know how to sell it, what use is it other than your own personal enjoyment, which is valuable. But that then it, that's a hobby. It's not a career. It's only a career if you can make money with it. So. That what I do now is like as I kind of learn these things and learn about running a gym or like selling instructionals or I mean anything like learn learning about the stock market, for instance, like I, I have money now I can actually invest in the stock market. It's a, it's a valuable thing for me to learn about or like understanding like what a mortgage is or what a, like an IRA is and or like what a 401k is like what, what it all is. I didn't learn any of that stuff. I dropped out of high school. I like they don't teach that in high school. Like how am I how was I supposed to discover it except experiencing it on my own? And so kind of part of my program which is pro essentially the the whole fighter house program that existed that I went through is it, I think it kind of follows the same idea. It's like try and give something to these these kids who love jiu-jitsu so much and you appreciate their love for jiu-jitsu but then you also know the pitfalls that they're going to experience and the pitfalls of life that jiu-jitsu is leaving them woefully unprepared for. And so the American Jiu-Jitsu name also, I would like to be synonymous with kind of changing that situation. And so what everything that I do now for the, the gym, even though it's like I'm focused on the gym's profitability and it's like success and all of that, I'm trying to present it or create it in a way that leaves an avenue of opportunity open for my black, what is that opportunity going to be? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. I, I can help them without them needing to learn how to uh, to fish, let's say. Like you can open affiliate gyms with your students or help set them, like do affiliate products with them. Potentially. They wouldn't really have to do anything. You could set up a system that just lets anyone sort of plug their information in and you can help them with it. Or you can actually teach them how to build their own thing. And in the process, of the, that's what happened to me. It's like I was helping Lloyd build his thing on whatever microscopic capacity I was able to at the time and learn from it. And that small situation where I was helping build Lloyd's thing set the seed to help me build my thing. And so if you're not incorporating that into your jujitsu gym for your students, it, you're, I feel like you're just not necessarily doing all you could as an instructor. 
if these guys, if these up and coming students, their goal is to make jujitsu a full career and you're not providing the career opportunity or the career education in some way. And then it's like, how do you make that work? There's like, cause it always comes into like the value given and taken, like what value are they bringing? Can you justify it? Can you take a hit in some way and still have it pay off and be mutually beneficial? And that's all to, remains to be seen, but, uh, I'm going to try. That's kind of like what I'm trying. Okay, so then I, I, from what you're talking about there, I have a few questions for you. One, yeah. and I, I'm then guessing you're looking long term. You're going to start an affiliation and grow yes. the, the brand. All right, and I then would like to, yeah, and then the next thing, which I think might be helpful for you, as you were saying, all the competitions are Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for the most part, besides ADCC or, e, or the EBI. Uh, I think what would be helpful for you if you started an American Jiu Jitsu tournament circuit. Because yeah. then you have, and you can make a differentiation with the rule set, you know, whatever right, that right. might be. Because now you have a venue for American Jiu Jitsu versus yeah. a guy who practices AJJ but competes in BJJ. Because I could see that being a little bit confusing from like just the normal things. Like, why are we doing this and we yeah, can yeah. the other rule set, you know? So Absolutely. Just something throwing out there. Do you think that is more valuable from like a function standpoint or like a perception standpoint? Like does the effort that goes into starting an entire new, like if I'm going to do it, I would try and do it right and start an actual, like an American Jiu Jitsu Federation or something and start a circuit and do the whole thing. Um, I just don't know if I have time. <laughs> I don't I, know if I, I can do you, it. <laughs> yeah, it is really a lot of work. So yeah, probably not imagine. worth, probably from where you're I, at right now, it's probably not the best. Yeah, it's a long way. It, well, it's a long way off regardless, but yeah. it's not something It definitely can't be disregarded. I actually can sit like part of the reason I got such a big gym right off the bat was because I had the intention of somehow holding some sort of event in there. I, I intentionally got a space that I can fit um, th three by two IBJJF mats so I can have the full six mat layout. I could have tables. I have room and I have room for seating. And that was my kind of my idea, maybe to potentially work into like a small scale version of what you're saying yeah. um and already even with that setup even with a not having to worry about a venue it's way too hard as this moment. it's like i don't even know where to begin um but yeah i would be i'd be open to that for sure yeah it, it, it's a lot of work to run tournaments i know like my brother and i when we opened our school we had to actually run tournaments to get the initial capital to start the gym oh really nice yeah so my brother and, and was i were, it, was it profitable it was so we started man in 1999 and what we actually did, I started training MMA or MHB in 1999. And like within the first few months of training, I was already fighting. But we were doing shoot fights, you know. And in Florida, we did like three of them. And then like in 2000, 2001, they outlawed uh, mixed martial arts. That's when they coined it. So we weren't able to host our tournaments anymore. And that's when we switched to grappling. Because we're like, oh, we can't run these events anymore. We got to change the event. We, okay, we could do, you know, submission wrestling, what we called it. Mm -hmm. And then we did like eight events like that. And uh, this was before the internet was a thing where you could like send out email blast and, you know, have people look it up. It was all through like paper flyers and emailing. Man, what a brutal. So, so much work, you know? And like yeah. I was 18, my brother was 19 when we were running these things. But, we made decent money. I mean, it wasn't like nowadays where you got like 1,000, 2,000 competitors. We had like three, 400 competitors. So it, was, yeah. it was good enough where we bought 96 Zebra mats, which is God knows how much. It's pretty, pretty yeah. penny, you know, for like college kid and uh, opened up the school. But it's a lot of work, you know, and I think where you're at right now, you're already, it looks like you're doing pretty good with the gym and your, your online websites are obviously see really well. I don't know if it's really worth it for you to go through that headache just yet. Maybe later down the road where you have things more established, at least in the school yeah. front, and you're looking for a new venture, that might be something to do. But like, and I'm sure the IBGF won't like you do it. <laughs> Not like <laughs> All the more reason to do it. Though. You got to try at least. <laughs> Fight the power hey, a little bit. Hey, 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 let me ask you something real quick. You mentioned about like training all these kids on how to market themselves and make money. And like, mm -hmm. man, like, by the way, if you ever start a one-on-one -on, -one on that, like, let me know. Maybe it's not too late for me. <laughs> like I suck at marketing, but like well, I, honestly, I, I to be honest, it's it. not me. I, ha I, I 
I just recognize what I don't know so I can hire people. So I actually have a team of people that deals with it. That's hiring the right sure. people. That's a, that's I, a very good skill, which I don't have either. But, and I'm uh, not, honestly, I've made some mistakes <laughs> hiring some people as well. But, uh, you know, because it, it is, it's become such an important part of BJJ. You're right, it's the ability to make money. Because if you're going to be, you know, doing this for a living in a highly competitive sport, when there's like a new gym popping up like in every corner every other week, Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to have to figure this out. My question to you is, you think that we are reaching a point of saturation or have we, will we reach that point? Because at least in terms of like social media and, and, and sales, online sales and gyms and these seminars, there's like every way of income that, you know, every way of making money with DJJ to me seems a little bit saturated already. Like, I don't think we've kind of reached a ceiling there. And this is maybe may why the sport is splintering. Like it's going in all these different directions. Like we have all these new rule sets and new approaches to jujitsu. Like things that we're talking about now. And to me, it's a part, like maybe that's a, a, um, it's a manifestation of the fact that the sport has grown so much. They have reached, we have reached ceilings and now we are looking for new ceilings, right? Like mm -hmm. what else can we do to be different? Because if I keep doing the same recycled recipe over and over, I mean, it's been done already. It's not going to, right? So, I mean, online, I guess, I, I don't know if there's, if there's a room for everyone to make money online. I think, I think there is for sure. I'm sorry, Kenan. Go ahead. Go ahead, David. What do you want to say? I, I think there is for sure plenty of growth available still online. I, I, I think we're just starting to tap into it now. I mean, you got guys. I mean, I think BJJ Fanatics has probably done like the best job of getting their name out there and and capturing a lot of talent, you know, and uh, from what I've heard of sales, they're doing pretty good, but it's still a lot more to go. I, I, I think the major shift for grappling that hasn't happened, and I don't know if, if it can happen, is it for it to become a spectator sport? Because mm -hmm. right now the money is made on practitioners and competitors. Like the people buying the DVDs are people who train and, and compete. When you basketball is not made, it doesn't make their money that way. All all the people watching don't play basketball. Yeah. The people playing football, I mean, watching football, they're not out in the gridiron running, you know, the hundred yard dash or anything like that. Jujitsu is still a is a practitioner sport. It's the people who are paying for it. If there's a way, and, and wrestling's the same thing, right? And, I mean, wrestling's been around since the beginning of time. Yet, for some reason, nobody can get people to freaking pay to watch it, you know? Besides yeah, that's pro a very wrestling. good point. So that's why I don't know if it's possible. And is it because the sport is very complex and, and as far as it's not intuitive to most people to understand, oh, the, there's a sweep in the guard, you know, or the guy in the guard's actually winning. Like, it just, from an untrained perspective, it makes no sense. So, mm -hmm. like, your average dude can't just pick it up and watch it, which is why MMA does better because at least they understand the striking and they're like, oh, okay, we get it. And people are getting smashed, you know? Yeah. Jiu-Jitsu, like, if you show your grandma Jiu-Jitsu, she's just confused. Like, why did that guy win with a triangle choke? They don't know what happened. Yeah. yeah. So that might be the thing American Jiu-Jitsu has to solve, Keenan. Yeah. I, I, listen, I've put, a, I've yeah. put a lot of thought into this. When I'm not thinking about lapel guards, I'm thinking about how to make money with jujitsu. Those are the two things I think about. And to answer Rob's question, or yeah, I mean, it's not, a, I don't really have an answer, I would say, but my opinion on it is that there, I think the act, I think the perception of what Brazilian jiu jitsu is actually holds it back too. I think the way that it's so, it's so focused on like the first, like imagine you're a white belt. And I know from statistics of like surveys and some data that I have on my sites that so much, so many of the people who sign up to my site and also come to my academy are there directly because of Jocko, Jocko and Joe. Like they are the catalysts of the massive movement more so than the UFC. It's, it's these two guys that every single podcast they're on, they talk about how awesome jujitsu is. They have such a crazy reach. Like Joe Rogan's reach is something insane. Like it's like astronomical numbers, bigger than TV networks back when they were at their prime. Like it's like ridiculous how many people he can reach and how many people really trust what he's saying. 
And if you watch a Joe Rogan podcast, he could be talking to a epidemiologist. He could be talking to an economist. He could be talking to a conspiracy theorist. He tells them all to do jujitsu. It doesn't matter who you are. He's telling them to do jujitsu. But that is not the approach that most people take when they talk about jujitsu or when they're trying to sell their, their jujitsu. They all revert to the same thing. They revert to this is it's self-defense. It's like you don't you want to learn how to be able to protect yourself? And like that's like it, that's what it's about. It's like at its core for a new person Ooh. getting in, they think it's a self-defense thing. But Joe and Jocko talk about it as a self-empowerment thing. It's like instead of being the victim, you're the guy who protects people from victimization. Like that's how they present it. That's what I think that's what young men are really looking for. More so like I don't think any of us at 19 were worried about how to defend ourselves. We weren't walking through alleyways scared. Like yeah. if anything, we're overly confident knowing that like no matter what happened we were going to win even if we knew nothing about martial arts whatsoever and i think a lot of that is tied to the traditional aspect of brazilian jiu-jitsu the stuff that was carried over from japanese jiu-jitsu and continues to uh, exist in brazilian jiu-jitsu a lot of the respect and the the discipline and the bowing to the senseis and all of that kind of perpetuates that idea because it's all connected it's this idea that like you're learn you started jujitsu or got into it because you're you didn't want to be victimized. And even though we all move away from that almost instantaneously and we no longer question that if ju that jujitsu is actually functional in a street fight or not, um, I think it probably gives people the wrong idea. I, I don't think we're accurately representing what jujitsu is and its its benefits. I think yoga does a much better job of marketing in itself for what it actually is, which is like a self help exercise it's like it makes you healthier mentally and physically and emotionally and that's what jujitsu does it is not it the true value of jujitsu has nothing to do with its ability to defend yourself in a street fight have you guys been in any street fights lately i sure haven't i haven't been, gotten to use jujitsu once since high school and that was back when i didn't even know jujitsu very well so it's like why are we basing the entire marketing campaign of jujitsu around this use that no one's actually going to use and you so Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I, I just want to finish your thought. I just want okay. to add something. There. Oh, I'm not done. I got a long ways to go. So. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, that is one component, I think. I think from it, like a saturation standpoint, I think absolutely not. We are not saturated whatsoever. However, to reach what uh, Dave said about spectator sport being the potential future for more money in jiu-jitsu, we can't reach that with a sport like jiu-jitsu until everyone's training in jiu-jitsu. It has to be so common in our culture that you can appreciate it because everyone does it. And I think it has that potential. Jiu-jitsu has the ability to become the world's national sport because every single person can participate in it. I have never seen a sport besides video games, if you can consider that a sport, which a lot of people do, that is so expansive and everyone can participate. There's yeah. something for everyone in video games. And it is considered a sport. So, and I don't think pe like any of either of you could go on an esports website and you would kind of understand what's going on. Even if you've never seen the game before, you would kind of, you would get why people are into it. It's like you, you watch the game for a second, you kind of understand because everyone plays games and you get the basic idea, which is just like, it's essentially the same thing as jujitsu. It gives you a sense of accomplishment over and over and over again. But instead of it being reality, it's a team of coders that optimize it to give you that feeling of accomplishment over and over and over again. So I think it's playing off of some base human psychology that we're not taking advantage of as marketers of jiu-jitsu, because that's really our job is to promote jiu-jitsu to the people, not just to improve it as a sport, which I totally agree with you there, Robert, on the open source aspect. We all have a duty to improve it over time and d distill the uh, effectiveness of it as much as possible. But I think we also have the duty to make it as accessible to everyone as possible. And the only way to make it accessible to everyone as possible is to not let it be founded too much in tradition because tradition is constricting and systems are constricting. And when you have a self-replicating system like jiu-jitsu, which is essentially what it is, we all get into jiu-jitsu, we open our gyms, we talk about all the same stuff. They then open their gyms. They talk about all the same stuff. They go through the history. Oh, yeah, the Gracies, blah, 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 UFC, jiu-jitsu, self-defense. It's like that's the same monologue that we all live with and i think if you take you there's definitely avenues to take jujitsu in a different realm like not necessarily i'm not saying turn jujitsu into zumba but i'm saying maybe make it a little more approachable for people and not make it about having to defend yourself and like a lot of people don't even want to consider that they don't want to think about getting you know 
assaulted on the, the street. And that's, that is not a primary concern for them. What are people concerned about? They're concerned about their mental health, a f- feeling like they're a part of a community, senses of accomplishment, and having a useful skill, right? It's like it, jujitsu scratches all the itches of what you need as a human. The only one it doesn't scratch is your need for money. <laughs> so that's the, that's the missing piece. It doesn't it doesn't give you money. It doesn't guarantee you money. So if you can fill that final gap and then also have an open mind of how you present it to a community and potentially change some of the the incredibly um, embedded understanding of what it is and let it be what jujitsu truly is, which is this infinite expression of human movement which is like the most beautiful thing ever if you think about it. All jiu-jitsu is is exploring every possible configuration that two bodies can have. Like that will g- continue forever. And the goal is the same, to win by making the other person give up. And just the fact that it exists in that way is like, it, it's, it's almost like uh, comparative to life and death. Like life, the, the, the entire functionality of our universe that we live on is like, order and chaos and like the r- rise and fall of things and it's it, 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 jujitsu represents i feel like in a distilled fashion the struggle for existence the struggle to win the struggle to survive and you get to experience it in this incredibly visceral way and it is so much more fun to experience than it is to watch someone else experience it yeah. it is not fun to watch someone else experience this glory if you feel nothing when you watch them, <laughs> like you watch other people do jiu-jitsu and you're like hmm that doesn't look That's like true. that much fun. It looks kind of <laughs> slow, and the guy's head is buried in the other guy's crotch. It doesn't. Look, it doesn't seem appealing yeah. <laughs> to me. And it's like, okay, the first, you get a white belt in off the street who just heard Joe Rogan talking it up for seven hundred and eighty episodes, and he's like, wait a second, like I'm gonna get beat up in the street if I don't know this. I have to ra- like that guy's got to wrap his legs around my head to start. Like that doesn't feel very empowering to a person, and I don't think it appeals to their psychology of what they want to do. So the fact that jujitsu still is growing so expansively and explosively even under circumstances like this. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I've, I've sent out some surveys to my students and 80% of them are, are ready to come back. Like they want to come back. They're not worried about the virus. It's like, they're over it. Like, let's just train again, which is fantastic news. Like I am pers- I was very happy to hear that. It's like, even if we, lo- even if we lost 20% of our members, it's like, I honestly thought it was going to be worse. So I'm, I'm hopeful for the situation. I'm happy for the situation. And I think we don't necessarily need all of jujitsu competitors to become extremely wealthy. Like I am, I'm very fortunate. My website does fantastic. My gym did fantastic right off the spot. I feel incredibly comfortable. I'm, I feel successful. This is great, but you don't necessarily need that level of businesses and like multiple business and multiple streams of income to feel successful with jujitsu from a monetary standpoint. There's plenty of ways to just have a comfortable livable income off of jujitsu that just even that doesn't exist you can't even just get by with jujitsu you have to have another job unless you are able to put in the time effort and energy to learn a skill outside of jujitsu like running a business or like marketing or some sort of other facet of the world that you can apply to your jujitsu so i think there's definitely ways to set up infrastructure that supports that so so that these jujitsu practitioners can kind of just go into it naturally I think there are ways to teach people to like just teach them how to fish instead of just giving them a fish. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity in the the realm of just doing better at making it more accommodating to new grapplers. Because I so an example of this, I like how Rob always says, I'll give you an example of this. It provides perfect context. I'll give you an example of this. The example <laughs> is so I have a, a white belt program and I do them in batches. So I'll I'll put out, oh, we'll do some marketing, we'll collect some emails and put them, like onboard them into our white belt program. And the white belt program is a two, is an eight week course. And it could just be a fault in the, the system that we set up. I'm just testing it, seeing how it works. But one thing is for sure, within a few days, I can get 30 white belts to show up at my gym all at once. And that seems powerful. It's like, wh- okay, where are those white belts coming from? I'm not that good at marketing. The product is really good. Jiu-jitsu is just naturally an a incredible product, but people don't know how incredible it is. So what brought these guys in? These guys don't know how good the product is. My marketing is not that good. I just put something in front of them. They wanted to do it. Turns out they all listen to Joe Rogan and Jocko. <laughs> so I've got this, this hunk of 
people, this all this these people and fresh geese to work with, how do I, in eight weeks, how do I convince them that jujitsu is the best possible thing for their lives? So first course, only six people converted. Terrible, it was failure, absolute failure. I, I, I don't know what went wrong exactly, but I tried my hardest. I set up a system of a curriculum. I taught fundamentals. I explained applications, not just in competitive sports, but in the street, self-defense type applications. I, I did all the things that everyone else does. I didn't, I didn't miss anything, trust me. Like I, I did the normal thing. Six people out of 30? I can do better than that. We can all do better than that. And I, I don't know if other gyms do that in batches. So maybe they don't see how many people actually drop off. I know when I was training at Autos, I never saw a white belt make it over to the other side. They all stayed on the white belt mat. There was only one white belt there that ever made it to uh, past purple belt. His name was Obdi. And he start, started as a white belt when I moved there. And he kept, he kept with it. Every other white belt did not continue. They all came from other gyms. They were blue belts from other gyms. They, they had some previous jiu-jitsu experience. It seems like most of the gyms are, or not most, from my perception of being at gyms, I haven't been to all the gyms, obviously, but from what I've seen, we're not doing a good job of getting white belts to stick around. And I don't think that is a personal preference you, you, on there. You know why that is? I, why? You know, in this business, and, I, and I, this is one of my, I, I don't like this aspect of it, but it is what it is. It's clicks. It's hard to incorporate these white belts into the culture and dynamics yeah. of the gym when they're not good, so no one talks to them. Because we have, we set these hierarchies in the gym. We go, oh, you're cool, you're successful, you're popular, you sit on there, over here on the hierarchy, you're a white belt, no one knows your name, no one cares about you. Why would that guy come back? He feels about our gyms the same way we feel about 24-hour fitness. Right. Zero loyalty, right? I, I've been making an enormous effort to like remember the names of all my white belts and having a relationship with every single one of them. And Absolutely. that right there is, is a very difficult thing to do because I, I'm busy. Like I, I, I work 12 hours a day. There's only so much yeah. to give. You know, so for me to be able to like develop a relationship with all these guys is incredibly difficult. And unless you have very good training instructors to do that when you're not exactly watching, when you're not for watching, sure. which is super hard to do, then very you know nice. you have a problem in your hands. And that, I think that's one of the main reasons why they leave is because they don't feel like they're part of something. So I what I do is this is what I recommend gym owners do. I partner them up, like I break the clicks. The second I see a click, I split it apart. If I see the Hawaiians with the Hawaiians, I put the Hawaiians with the Filipinos, the Filipinos with the, the, the Chinese, the Brazilians with the Mexicans. I mix it all up, right? Whatever kind of clicks I see in the gym, I make an effort to split it because I want to make sure that every group is what? Is bonding with everyone else. Like every person is bonding with everyone else versus just like, oh, let's not talk to those guys over there because, you know, that's not, he's new. He's not good at jujitsu, right? So I think isolating a student is very, very bad for the gym's culture. You know, and we all do it. It's it's and we all have our favorites. You know, it's very hard to, to stop that. Yeah. And I, I tried. I thought I would solve that problem by having them all start together and go through it together, like some sort of experience that they feel accomplished from. And I tried to provide some sense of uh, accomplishment at the end of the course and all of that. Um, regardless, it was it was a it was a failure. And I totally agree. Incorporating a system into just the instructors and the other students to try and make people feel as welcome as possible is important. Um, yeah, there's. There, I think this the ceiling that you're talking about. I think there is just the ceiling is so much higher than we think it is, just because of optimizations like that. And I think you can apply those across the entire spectrum of jujitsu, and you can find ways to optimize exactly like what you're saying. Like that's one thing you could do that would improve the conversion of new people into it. There's probably thousands more. And if we could find them and test them and then systemize them and then somehow disperse that information to as many people as possible, that would be good for everyone overall. And then we, that would push us towards the uh, the, the ultimate goal, which is to somehow make jiu-jitsu a spectator sport, which I'm not confident in. But I think the only, the, the, I know for sure that people who like jiu-jitsu also like watching jiu-jitsu but not the other way around. So it seems like the only option is to make sure everyone does jiu-jitsu to get them to appreciate it. So that's kind of my thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a good way to... That's probably the realistic way of getting it done, to be honest, because I don't see it going any other way. Like you said, like, you just got to get everybody doing jiu-jitsu. Yeah, I mean. you, no amount of rule changes is going to do it. It's just like all the rule sets are boring. There's no configuration that is not boring. Like, it's not the rules that make it boring. It's just the fundamental nature of jiu-jitsu. It just does not feel exciting to an outside perspective. You have to be doing it to be in, in the magic. Yeah, you know? I couldn't agree more. I have a hard time watching. I'm not going to lie. 
I don't watch it either. I, 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 yeah, I don't tournaments. Watch. I watch, I, I look over, you know, like I, I have a hard time watching a, a match from beginning to end unless you know it's going to be fireworks. And it is yeah. fireworks. Otherwise, they'll lose my attention. Even if they're world champions, they'll lose my attention. I, I remember I used to study ADCC videos all the time because I wanted to see what was going on with the competition, how they used the rules. You can't fall asleep faster than watching those things, especially the older ones that had the tribal music in the background. You like you finish training, you come back home. Okay, I'm gonna watch these videos and study. And like, you know, you're sleeping like five minutes. And like, son of a bitch, you know, like it's just it's difficult, you know. And these are and this is me trying to do homework, you know. I'm trying to, I'm invested in this, you know. So yeah, for the average person, I think it's just it's a it's a tall order. So yeah, Keenan, you do have that. I think the right approach in the sense that we just got to get more people into it. But uh, I think uh, that's interesting that you did that survey and it came out so heavy for Joe and Jocko. And I guess that's a, a great retraining more people got to hop on. You know, it's because it's like you said, it's a, I mean, well, at least $100 million mach marketing machine in your favor. <laughs> right, exactly. Right? <laughs> it's, they're literally working for us. And we, we just got to catch the fish they're throwing at us because it's huge. And I think like. Who knows? I, I think as more as jujitsu grows, as we continue to push jujitsu to as many people as possible, we're going to have more situations like that where we have these highly influential figures falling in love with it, like we have fallen in love with it, and then they'll use the platforms to push it, and we all directly benefit from that. So it's in our best interest to to try and spread information and tell people how to get more people into their gyms and to tell them how to make it more approachable and fun for everyone and share that information. Which, I mean, that's like how the masterminds kind of work, right? It's the same idea. And I've, I don't really know how those systems work, but I would imagine that's a similar system. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of our only option. And ultimately, even even if there is no way for someone to monetize jujitsu without learning an outside skill, which is probably how it is, just having more people doing it presents hugely more opportunity over time. And it'll 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 kind of fuel itself because then you have like guys like Andrew Yang, like there there could potentially be a president in of the United States who talks about jujitsu. That would be the ultimate, right? Like you have a president who's it like, oh be yeah, the first time Theodore Roosevelt will right. Be <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wouldn't be the first time though, but right, uh, right. It's, it's it's so fascinating because I mean I I I know I can be like a nerd with this stuff because I got into it the last few years, but. It's we're just reliving history, man. Like it's yeah. when you look at jujitsu where it was, well, judo slash jujitsu early in the 20th century. We're just reliving it, like the same discussion, and it's it's more sophisticated. Don't get me wrong, like the whole thing, everything's yeah. gotten better. But like the PR, the marketing, like the 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 boom, you know, it's it's fascinating to observe. Uh, Keenan, let me ask you something really quick. I originally originally asked you uh, for an hour of your time. We're in an hour and thirty minutes. Can you keep going, or do you got to go? I don't want to be rude. Yeah, I, no, I, I got I got another half hour. Let's say. Okay, I got about a half hour too. Dave, you good? Yeah, I'm good. All right. Um, uh, I was going to ask you uh, one of the questions that I came into my head before you got here, <laughs> which now I can get to, is uh, you've trained in a bunch of different places. You said you've been with BJ Penn. You've trained with Lloyd Irvin, you're trained at Atos, uh, excellent coaches, instructors. What lessons have you learned from each of, of these influences as far as like your jiu-jitsu and how are you going to make that part, since you're, you're big on American jiu-jitsu, how are you going to make that part of the American jiu-jitsu brand and, and form it that way? Yeah, in, that's an interesting question. I would say that's tough. Most of what I learned training at different gyms was not technique focused because you can get good technique from anywhere and it all is a little different but ultimately we're all like robert has been saying it's the it all comes from the same source like it's all functioning on the same rules right so hmm, i i guess i have to clarify is it more like from a technical approach like actual jiu-jitsu movements or like Overall, everything that I've learned. Uh, I'm thinking more overall, like okay, what like your your approach to jujitsu or your approach to training. You know, because I know you're you probably have aspirations of coaching athletes and getting them mm -hmm. to the top level. So, like, uh, as these are guys who are top competitors or at top competition teams, you know, what yeah. type of things did you pick up? Because I know I've gotten okay, to, yeah. I've gotten to train obviously with Lloyd Irvin, but I also got to train with Atos a couple times out there. So. To, at least from from my brief thing, they have a similar intensity in the drilling yeah. and all that, which I was pleasantly surprised with. But I, I'm curious. I know that 
we had Cadell here a while back, and you know he's very anti-drilling. You know, mm-hmm. and you have other people who you know they're all their place. So I'm curious to see where you're lying at now. Yeah. So just there, there's definitely one unifying factor between all those places, and I would say the the biggest indicator for success from a jujitsu team perspective and doing well in a competitive setting is having a, a, as many talented guys on the mat as possible and letting them spar as much as possible. The more sparring you can do with high level guys around you, the, the higher level the room becomes. And it, that seems to be 80% of the battle is just getting enough good guys in the room to where it starts to be a machine that fuels itself. And it's just like all of these guys are incredibly talented. They're picking up stuff from each other on a daily basis. They're sharing information on a daily basis. They're adapting and challenging each other and pushing each other. And they're all rowing in the same direction towards this similar goal. That's an incredibly powerful thing, not just in jujitsu, but probably any other goal you're going to pursue if you have a bunch of people going in the same direction hugely beneficial so aside from that i think the biggest difference between all of the gyms is how they each approach the mindset and this was this is what makes me think that set universal primarily and it seems like and from my experience as well the mindset that is suggested from these coaches doesn't necessarily work for me, but it's a great foundation for me to start developing my own mindset on things and how, like what works for me, what gets me in the zone, what gets me focused, what get, keeps me motivated. So yeah, I don't, I don't I don't think that the mindset that they push in speci- like specifics is very important, but that again, the mindset that it is unifying between all this gym success is hard work. And I mean, it's, it's, that seems obvious when you say it, it's just hard work, a talented room. That's about all you need. It's too like, simple. It beca- that's why no one likes it's that. too, it's yeah, <laughs> it's too simple. It's just like you, it becomes a snowball rolling down a hill. You, you put three tough guys in a room and they're all killing each other. And then they go and do well in competitions because they have more tough training partners than anyone else. The fourth guy, the fourth guy becomes one of the guys that they beat. That's like, holy shit. What was that guy doing? Why is it different? Oh, he just like, they have a sick room. I'm going to go join the room. And then they're looking for the answer. And then they, they already put themselves in the answer just by joining the room. And that's what I've done at every gym that, that I've joined a team. It's because I recognize that they have a good room. So building the room is the most important thing. And so my approach to this, this has been, uh, whatever the cost, build the room. If you can build the room quickly, then the success for the competition will follow. And I haven't tested that, but I'm pretty sure like my room is good already. Like I have got a good room and it's enough to push me. And I, I, I can train at a, a, a higher level than I can compete at. Like in the room, that's where I thrive. I'm a gym warrior. Like I, I just fo- like I analyze people's games. I specifically do techniques that are purely to beat their game and have no application outside of it whatsoever. It's a, it, it holds me back in competition because I do that instead of focusing on my a game that should apply to everyone. But I think it provides, it makes me a good training partner for a lot of people because I specifically will try and beat you at your game with moves that directly expose or attack the weaknesses that I see in people's jujitsu. So from a sport psychology standpoint, I I don't think I even understand my own psychology well enough to coach other people on theirs. Like I, that's been the biggest struggle for me, just fighting against myself and my own uh, weaknesses mentally for competing. I think having having someone who has an incredibly strong mental focus around you kind of can help you get past your own mental blockades and i think that's what i felt at at lloyd's the most was that everyone had an incredibly strong mind because lloyd always pushed that very tough mindset and there's different facets to that like a lot of times that turns into like an us against them mentality and it's like where it's us versus the world it's this small group we're fighting against this bigger power and i think that was a hugely unifying thing for us at lloyd's was like they're going to screw us. So we're going to go out there. It's us versus the opponent and the ref and everyone else. They're going to be talking in you know, Portuguese, coaching against us, and we don't speak Portuguese, so we're going to get screwed regardless. We have to win. We have to kill them. You have to submit every single person or you're not going to be able to win. And that severity on the situation does – it makes you train harder for sure. And then it like, creates like sort of a unifying thing. There are downsides to that as well because then we all kind of fall, fall into the same track, We and which is good for competition. You all become robots and you just listen to what the coach says. And like if you can let go of your, your own mental uh, 
gymnastics you have to do with yourself to talk yourself into or out of good and bad ideas or even just the things you have to do like competing um it can be negative as well it can burn you out which i think is something we saw from that environment more than anything it was the burnout because while i was there i know i was getting burned out i know jt was getting burned out i know jimmy burned out and i know dj burned out and there's a lot of burnout in that place and eventually we all come back because it's like you burn out you you get over it you realize that jiu-jitsu is all you got and you go back to it and you're like i gotta just <laughs> accept this this is all i got so <laughs> <laughs> so you get so once you're once you're in the whirlpool of jiu-jitsu and you you, there, you there's no way out of it because nothing compares literally nothing else is very fun for most people that get into that mindset so at autos it's a little different it's a little more open like there isn't as much guidance from like a coaching standpoint it was kind of just it 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 let the sandbox mentality thrive for me at least but there is some resistance to it because there is more like what you're talking about, what, what I do works, like, this is how you should do it. This is the right way to do it. Not necessarily from a technique point, but like showing up like to training and how the training has to function. There was no flexibility in like letting people train in a way that works best for them. So I understand that drilling is very beneficial for a lot of people. I personally don't like drilling. I don't, I, I don't repeat moves really. Like that's not my style. Like when I, when I, when I train or when I compete, it's very much just a flow. And I, I practice the flow more than I practice the techniques. Like I practice the ability to transition to new positions that we are both unfamiliar with rather than practicing a specific technique that it's like, if I can get there, I understand this realm, this frame of reference in this particular technique. And I think there's different ways to, uh, for people to improve. And one of them is to be a little more free flowing with your training. And uh, you definitely need to spar really hard. Um, I think hard sparring is the key. Like if you, if you put two, if you have two groups, you've got one group that only spars and one group that spars and drills. I think the group that only spars, like that gets more sparring in is going to kick the ass of the group that spars and drills. Like if you have a limited amount of time, an hour to train and you choose how to use that, if you spend a half hour drilling and sparring or the full hour sparring, I think we saw that with the Saracosta's gym. And, uh, I think like they drilled a lot too, but the, the emphasis was on sparring and they just drilled when they weren't sparring. So it's just a ridiculous amount of training. So it's not a perfect crossover analogy, but, um, I think the sparring is hyper important. When I spent some time at John Danaher's basement, Henzo's gym, John Danaher's okay. basement. Um, I, I was, I've trained there quite a few times. Um, the previous instance I was there the longest, they had, they had a little bit of a different approach. It was very much like this technical guru approach. It wasn't as much about the crazy hard training. It was about consistency and like r really trusting that this guy has the answers on a technical level and that you just need to learn the, the technical level things. And if you do them just how he said, you will be successful. I don't think that's accurate because if you look at their team, like Gary is good for sure. He's he's very good at jiu-jitsu, but he never he never reached the same level as Gordon. And like Ethan's very good. He never reached the same level as Gordon. Uh, Nikki might reach the same level as Gordon from from a genetic standpoint. Like maybe Gordon's got some some something that the rest of those guys don't. But it doesn't seem like the rest of the team can implement John Danaher's techniques as effectively as Gordon. And then that makes you wonder, well, how much of that is John and how much of that is Gordon? And so that that's another style that I witnessed. And then. The final one that I would compare to, because the only other place I trained that has really high level guys that um, I spent a significant amount of time at was Homolo's gym. And at Homolo's gym, it was kind of a mixture of all those things. It was like Homolo was incredibly knowledgeable, but he knew what he was knowledgeable about. And he didn't try and teach things that he wasn't knowledgeable about, which at Autos was not the same. Like Andre would teach lapel guards in class. And it's like, well, I, it doesn't really make sense for, to me for him to teach it because he could focus on the things that he really understands, like on a deep, intimate level of, that he's spent 25 years practicing. It's like, I, I think instructors should focus on what they're really good at and kind of delegate to who, to who actually knows the, the positions even better. Um, like if, if the intention is to make sure that the room improves, you know, like I, I just think that it should be spread out a little more. And Homolo did that. He was more focused on like, this is what I know. This is what I'm really good at. This is these are the moves that I know will work for any of you. And I know them inside and out. And those are the ones I'm going to teach. And then if there was something else, he would be like, oh, this guy does that. And he would always talk about how he like bought this guy's instructional and studied it. And he learned so much. But he's not going to show it to you. You should just go look at it because he, he it's whatever he got is a copy of the copy. And it's not quite as, it's not a, a perfect 
uh, regurgitation of the information, let's say. Um, so that was kind of interesting as well uh, to take that approach. And a lot of a lot of Homolo's guys seem to reflect that. And they have a much more diverging styles. All the styles at Homolo's are very, very different. Everyone has a very specific game. It's like two to three moves that they're like super good at. And none of those moves are something that you find in Homolo's game. Um, and like Gabriel R just has like incredibly technical but flowing style and he plays a lot of like open guards and not very much spite he like plays open guard without using spider hooks a lot and he kind of baron bolos but not really and it's a totally different style of like inversion game he plays it reminds me a lot of jimmy harbison's game actually um and then you have zane who's a really tough brown belt who just has a really great close guard and a one particular close guard sweep that he sweeps everyone with and then it's kind of all well-rounded overall and so, like, you can kind of see the divergence in how the students grow and how how they f grow into their their uh, particular jujitsu game based on these differences between the instructors. So at John's, it's everyone is doing John's moves. Everyone. They're all doing it, but not to the same success. So that kind of goes back to what Rob was saying about how there is no wrong way to do things. You have to be able to explore the boundaries of something to see how it fits into your body. Everyone's got a different length forearm for a heel hook, or everyone's got a different wrist control. Like everyone's hands are different. Maybe you have a wrist injury or some sort of lack of flexibility or hyper flexibility that lets you do something slightly different. And I think if you fit, try and fit too much within the lines, you're constricted. And if you try and go too much out of the lines, you're constricted and I don't think there's a perfect way to do it um, except to just be really like try and let your ego go as much as possible and really only teach the like show them moves that you truly understand and if there is a better resource for it being able to say there is a better resource for this you should learn it from this guy and like try and facilitate that engagement um, which I haven't really seen many people do yet but I, I think I would like to try try that approach maybe like focus more on bringing coaches in, which uh, Lloyd actually did that a lot. Cause like, I remember he would bring in guys for seminars all the time, like you and uh, I think Hoffa and he Mendez came in for a while. So I think he was kind of doing that same approach, but it also seemed like he, he was very distracted with his other businesses and stuff. It's like, sometimes he was there, sometimes he wasn't. And a lot of it kind of, a lot of the burden of coaching and that sort of guidance fell on JT. I feel like back in those days, um, so yeah, it's just there's a lot of different ways to do it. They all seem to be successful. I, I don't know the best way. I, I think if I had to choose, though, it would just be get as many tough guys on the mat and let them kill each other, and I don't think you can go wrong with that. It's funny you say that. I saw what I always tell people. I think people try to overthink things. and they, The thing is, like that's it's a simple recipe, but it's a hard recipe. That's the thing that people don't like about it is because, you know, killing yourself on the mats is such a simple, like, yeah, just anyone like, okay, I got that. But at the same time, it's incredibly difficult for you to perform that way every day in the gym, six days a week for years on end, because it destroys yep. your body, man. Like, I remember, like, pulling myself up while using the rail up the stairs, because, like, my legs had nothing left in them. I didn't want to pick up my daughters. I was so tired. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, one you one feeling like that, before you continue, uh, that fe those feelings are like nothing I've ever experienced anywhere else in jiu-jitsu. That incredibly hard training after effect is so intense and there was a, there was a point in time where i was training so hard and so often that when i i finally got injured and i woke up after like two days of resting and i felt like i was high i was like why do i feel like an altered state right now what is going on and then as i continued to be injured i realized that was just normal i was like oh this is what normal feels like this is me rested and i feel good and it, i thought i was i felt like i was high on drugs or something because yeah. i just become so accustomed to living as this starving dog type training where it's just i'd constantly be killing myself just begging for a nap at any turn you sorry to interrupt yeah. you, no you get used to being overtrained, and then you think that's the norm and I know exactly what you're talking about because, like, when I so like, there's a few times where I force myself to take two, three days off, and I come back and I feel like Superman, man. Like, I'm actually happy again, you know, like, I was smiling in the gym, you yeah, because you get used to being miserable. But that's that's the thing, you have to get used to being miserable. And I think that is the, the equation, right? Uh, but I think people are always trying to, like, just like, let's, let's find an easier way of doing it because this is too hard. So that's where like a lot of like the methodology comes in. Oh, it's the methodology that needs to change. Cause if I find a better superior method, that way I don't have to do all that hard work. When the hard work, what you're describing there, that's 99% of the equation right there. You know, the other 1%, yeah. yeah, maybe, maybe you drink orange juice in the morning and I don't, but that's not why you're winning. 
that's like a yeah. drill to me is like it's like cosmetics it's not that it's not important it doesn't work it's just that it's the it's not the common denominator you know we've seen way too many people win without ever drilling like i never drilled a day of my life Bushesha told me he never drilled a day of his life you know so you know, I, I think it's just one of those things where people are looking for a shortcut a lot of times when, like, they get stuck with this, this methodology kind of discussion. And it, it really comes down to, like, it's just good old, you know, just train hard every day, be consistent over the years, and be competitive, be aggressive, you know, about it, not just showing up, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think the the final 1% of that hard training, if, if your goal is, like, ultimate competitive success, it is 99% hard training and 1% uh, self-study. I think it's like if if you look if you train enough that is the most vast collection of information you can get. You can't study harder than the amount of information you get from training hard all of the time. Like being able to explore every little detail from training so hard and understanding your own body and really coming to terms with what you need to do to be more successful in this thing that you're focusing so hard on. Um that only comes with hard training. But the, uh, the, the other side that is very important is just acquiring as much information as possible, enough, uh, uh, as much accurate information as possible. So there's like this, there was this inis initial phase for me when I started taking jujitsu more seriously where listening to the, and I started studying and just looking at every single possible movement that looked like it had some validity and then just trying them all. And I can I I started doing that at around 14, and I continued to do it to this day, where I look I constantly look up new moves. I try and spot new moves, and then I, when I see a new one, I always try it. So like tonight, I'm gonna go try close guard Kimura. Like that's what I'm gonna spend the night doing. Like I, I I don't necessarily have to see it, but I see I see the idea, and I'm gonna try it, and I'll probably discover some stuff on my own and kind of figure out how it works. And that's just one more tool I have in in the toolbox. Um, and I think anyone can do that especially and that's kind of like where jujitsu like that's where you can make money in jujitsu is you have a lot of valuable information that's can be presented through your personal lens which it's like we can all teach the same move but each of us is going to teach it differently with different details and your twist that you put on it comes from your personal experience and that's valuable because that's one of the parallel paths on the flow chart of that movement that you can never really like you you can cut the thing in half infinitely and you're always going to have half of what's left of the cut, right? And that's the same thing with jujitsu. It's like you can break it down into as many little pieces as you want, but there's always a smaller piece that diverges. And that's why there's value in each person's individual experience. And that's why I think that in, like online, especially instructionals, will be will continue forever because you can never teach the same move twice even, right? Unless you're just literally it's a carbon copy of what you said last time. But every time you go back to teach a new move and you teach it from your heart and from your head, you're going to implement changes that you yourself had implemented without you really even realizing from just training more and trying to move more, whether it was a year ago or a week ago, it's always going to change. Well, I wanted it. to get to one thing that you mentioned, or both of you guys mentioned about the training rooms, about the hard training, right? I guess I'm telling you right now, I feel like half dead because I got my first lift in since the quarantine. I was using bands and, you know, like, I thought, well, it's not going to be the same, but at least it'll be something. Bro, mm -hmm. I did legs yesterday, chest. I mean, I did legs Monday, chest yesterday, and my whole body's on fire. Everything hurts. Pretty much sitting down like this is painful. <laughs> but it, it brings me to the point of the overtraining, right? Because mm -hmm. I came up in the wrestling background also, and you, you just train as hard as you can. And I think even in high school, we were doing like three-hour practices every day. Bye, 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 bye. And then on the weekends, we'd go running. And you get that feeling that, you, that Keenan you know, and Rob, you guys were talking about, where you're just sore all the time. And I remember when I finished my final match of my season, of my senior year, I sat down and I was crying because I lost. I didn't make states or whatever. But then I just woke up and I just felt pain everywhere and I realized my ankle was like a watermelon it was swollen and my knee was messed up and I was like hobbling and like oh I've been living like this in this cloud yeah. you know like for months and now that I'm out of the competitive zone for a moment I can experience this pain and we were taught that way but I, I've, I've argued this with Robert too is that the right way of doing it or is it just the way that 
we were put into it and mm-hmm. we just keep perpetuating it because I feel like as I've gotten older, I, I think that approach is flawed because we're essentially training weak, right? We're not training. It's like, like uh, now my fighters are, are doing this where they're fit year round, right? They're never out of shape. Like, oh, I got to diet and then, you know, do the big fucking weight cut. I mean, they have to do the water cut, but they're always, you know, lean. Whereas I remember like me and like old school fighters, like once you would fight, then you would like, you know, fuck off for a couple months, get fat. And then, oh, I got to diet again. And, you know, doing that seesaw battle. So we weren't really living like the lifestyle of being fit year round, which allows you to train 100%. Because I, I would remember training and I was always, I was getting beat by everybody because I was, I was low on calories and I was, you know, deprived of rest because I was so hungry all the time that you can't train well. And even when you're, you're well, uh, you're eating well, but you're training too hard, you're not going to train to the best of your capacity. And as a result, to me, that means your practice suffers, your technique suffers. And sometimes that results in injury because you're overextended. Absolutely. I, I think as a younger guy, you can get away with that and you probably should because you need to push the limits when you can right? Like mm-hmm. the guys in their teens and their twenties, you know, you got to go balls to the wall. So you, you have the, those gym wars, those experiences, because they're much more costly on competition. But at a certain point there is like a diminishing returns, right? Because now when you do too many of those wars, you start getting injured more and then you can't compete. Yeah. So I feel like that's one of the things that I look at now is like, the training doesn't stay the same forever, right? I mean, that's that should be kind of obvious, but it, it isn't because even you have, you know, you're in your 30s and you're in the twilight of your career and you're training the same as you did in your teens, you won't last, you know, unless you're taking some special vitamins. It's not going to really work out for you. Yeah, let me cut in there because I, I, I experienced that last sentence, especially brutally. So this is, this is what happened to me and my realization of that as well because – I mean, I'm still pretty young, but I definitely don't recover as fast as I did when I was 22 or 23. I'm 28 now. And around 26, I had to kind of slow down the training. And I think a huge part of that was training with people who are on the special supplements. And I couldn't keep up. Like, if I continued to train how I did at Lloyd's, I would try. But this time, the group of people I was around wouldn't, I couldn't keep up. I couldn't train as much as them. So I, I was actually that, that damage to my body that you were describing, it was happening on an even more intense scale because now not only was I training the same amount, if not more, but I was training with stronger people who do not get as worn down as I did. Uh So I couldn't actually compete on just a physicality standpoint. So the only way that I could counter that to continue being able to train and not get get hurt and even be in it because for years i was like there was an entire year where like i was dislocating my kneecap over and over again i had a herniated disc i like could barely train someone grabbed my head in a guillotine for and i fought out of it i wouldn't be able to train for two weeks because my neck would be so fucked up and i just thought it would go away because it always went away before you know like i back at <laughs> back at lloyd's i used to walk around it felt like i had a knife stuck in my back all the time and i never understood why and I, it was just like a, a tight muscle that just never went away. And it was so painful. All I, all I needed was a massage and a foam roller. But I didn't even have a concept of like how to use those things properly. So I just suffered with it for like two years. And then I started to realize, like, oh, you actually can take care of your body and it, it helps. And so I, I, I changed my, my training strategy to just train. I trained when I felt good but not when I felt really bad. Like I didn't force myself to train when I felt really bad where I used to do it. I would just like force myself and I'd be like, it's good for me. But it became just like what you're saying. If I force myself, I'm probably going to get hurt and it's going to be counterproductive. So I changed my strategy. I was like, well, what can I do in my downtime that directly benefits this issue that I'm feeling? And the answer is weightlifting, of course, because it's like, well, weightlifting, it's not super cardio intensive. It's just breaking down your muscle fibers, which seems to be a different thing. It's almost like jujitsu breaks down your nervous system on some level. And like you, you, you feel it deeper than muscle soreness. I don't know what it is, but I walk around feeling like my eyes are like closing up and it's just, (laughs) I don't know what the feel, I can't describe the feeling. So I started lifting as a supplementary thing and that changed everything. It let, it let me be more durable because I had a little bit more muscle mass. 
And I had been lifting throughout my entire career, but I started taking it more seriously. And I, I haven't been as much lately because I've been trying to run the gym. But th there was a time where I was lifting almost as much as I was training. So I had an equal amount of lifting sessions as training sessions. I would replace, I used to train twice a day jujitsu and three times a week lifting. And then I changed it to once a day jujitsu, once a day lifting. So I would, I would lift before I would train. So I'd, I would try and either train in the morning and lift at night or vice versa. And that actually allowed me to become a lot better at jujitsu. Cause like you're saying, I was no longer fighting from this de dilapidated state where I'm just like barely able to function, but I'm just, I can do it because my jujitsu was good enough, but I didn't really know what I was truly capable of from a physicality standpoint until you do that when you're rested and you take the time to take care of your body and build strength and push yourself to a different potential. So there's like your mental potential, which is just training hard all the time and forcing yourself to do it, which is important to do because you need to know how far you can be pushed before you break. And then there's the other side of things where you can reach your physical potential by, by disregarding that crazy uh, mental strength that you need to force yourself to go train all the time. And you can redirect it towards improving your physicality and uh, recovery. So you can be stronger and train more often, which seemed to be what was allowed. Like that, that's the incentive to do steroids, right? Is like you get to train more often and not get injured as much. And so you spend more time on the mats in addition to whatever extra strength it gives you. So I was trying, kind of try found a way to supplement it at the cost of my, the amount of time on the mats. And I replaced that amount of time on the mats with more off the mat focus on jujitsu. So then I started just thinking about jujitsu more often rather than just training it as much as possible. Cause I used to train so much that the last thing I wanted to do was think about jujitsu off the mats. It's like, once I stepped off the mats, I would rush out of the gym. I would shower as quickly as possible just so I could shower first. So I didn't have to wait there any longer. And I would leave the place as quickly as I could. So I can start thinking about other things and like not have to worry about jujitsu anymore. And so when I started, when I took a step back and started treating it more like, okay, I want to do this when I feel good and I'm going to try and optimize my time better, then I actually had the energy and the inclination to think about jiu-jitsu off the mats. And that most of my technical progress came from that period of time. So that was when I started developing lapel guard stuff because prior to that, I was kind of playing around with lapels, but I, I was more traditional. I had a lot of spider guard, open guard stuff and did traditional passing. But when I was able to take that time off to really focus, I'm like, wow, okay, how creative can I get with this thing and like really put some deliberate effort into cr creating a new system and actually spending time thinking about it. it it's I was surprised with how little I was doing of that before like when I made that a priority to actually think about jujitsu and like think about alternative paths of accomplishing the same goal whether it be a sweep or a pass or a submission using this new tool that I was I really liked because no one else was using it. Um, that led to most of my technical progress as well as my ability to substantiate a career and make money because I, I created a system that is unique to me. It's very well thought out. I can teach it to anyone from white to black belt level and everyone can find success with it. And in the process of having more energy, my brain was able to function better. And it turns out my brain is my best feature. <laughs> like if I, if I can't use it, I'm screwing myself over. So my physicality was not like training super hard was not serving me anymore. From be, like beyond just like the mental toughness was acquired. And once you acquire the mental toughness, as long as you can retain the mental toughness, which you can, because you can work really hard off the mats. You guys know how, how hard you can work without killing your physical body. You can work your brain much harder than you can work your body. It lasts longer, you know? And it actually seems to gain momentum. The more you work, it's like you can work harder, longer, longer, and it doesn't burn out as much. So I, that that shift in understanding for me was like revolutionary to my life. I stopped hating jujitsu. Like I didn't hate it, but you know, you know the feeling. You start to hate it at a certain point. You're like anything that you do that much, and you're forcing yourself to do it, and you feel like shit all the time. You're gonna start to resent it. So it eliminated the resentment. It provided huge opportunity of growth mentally and technically. And I was able to get stronger and bigger because I was burning less calories and that extra strength actually allowed, opened up more of a game. So then I could actually put pressure. So I learned how to actually apply pressure because I had the strength to actually make it efficient. So previously I was just really flexible. And so I had this like this tree of moves I could do because I was hyper flexible, but I couldn't do any of the, the strong guy moves on the other side of the spectrum. So then I kept my flexibility and I started adding strength. And then the whole world of pressure and strength game opened up to me. And that doubled the tools I was working with there. And at the same time, I was able to focus on creating a
system of the kind of the hell guard, which I guess would kind of fall in between maybe. So that was hugely beneficial. So I totally agree that there is a certain point you have to change your prerogative. Yeah. yeah like, like, like you said, me and Rob have talked about this before, but toughness once acquired rarely leaves you. You know, like you, yeah. you've learned the lesson of it and you understand the limits that you have. And I, and I, I think, think that's the primary value. Yeah. Hey, uh, guys, I, I this I could keep going for another. I gotta call my daughters. I know that if I don't call them now, I don't get to talk to them later. For no sure. worries. But uh, man, like uh, Keenan, um, man, such a gentleman. Thank you so much. I had so much fun. I knew we would have uh, a lot to talk about. Uh, let's do this again at some point. Absolutely. I had a, it was a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. For sure. And Keenan, before we let you off, uh, go ahead and let people know where they can find you online and your courses and all that good stuff. Yep, I have. Uh, you can find me in three places, KeenanOnline.com, LapelGuard.com, and on Instagram, I'm Keenan Cornelius, at Keenan Cornelius. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> and uh, if you ever, whenever, next time you come to Vegas, man, definitely stop by. I know you've been here uh, before. Man, next time, just let's just do something together, man. Let's just have sure. a seminar, some rolls, sit down, grab dinner or something, man. It'd be good. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. I'll catch up with you later. All, All right. right. Take care, everybody. So much, See ya. Right. Bye.